All right, everybody, this is Comic Book Historian Podcast. We are continuing from the Dallas Fantasy Fair with uh, Robert Bierbaum as our guest. I'm here joined with my co-host, Jim Thompson. Jim, how's it going? Hey, Alex, it's been a while. It's been a while. I'm glad to hear your voice. I'm glad to see your guys' faces, although the audience cannot. Um, that being said... Soon they will be. <laughs> soon, that's right, in the future. Uh, CBH Podcast 2.0, here we come. Essentially, at the Dallas Fantasy Fair, Bob, on the YouTube channel, we have a panel that kind of started off with from the late 60s to early 70s. Today, I wanted to, because we had a limited amount of time, I wanted to start off at around 1975. Um, 1975, so you're well into comics and comics, and you leave comics and comics and open up your own store the next year called Best of Two Worlds, which had two locations in Northern California. Is that correct? Well, it started off with one. Uh-huh. In, that was in early November 1976. Okay. In the Haight Ashbury, 1707 Haight Street, at the near the corner of Cole, right across the street from the original, legendary Straight Theater. Yes. Where a lot of shows were held there. Well, did in Jefferson Airplane, etc. And you saw all those guys, is that right? Uh I would see them on occasion. Mm-hmm. I was. As, as life was progressing, I was busy most of those years pretty much working almost seven days a week, it seemed, in the comic book stores, especially when I got more than one store. Right, right. I, I went into a second comic book store um, in May of 1977 when my ex-partners at Comics and Comics, they moved up the street to be uh, one block closer. Oh, I see. Okay, okay. Uh, there was a Mexican restaurant on the corner, which is now Amoeba Records. Oh, I see. And the uh-huh. old the old Comics and Comics location is what they call a Amoeba Classics for all the classical music section that they got there. Uh-huh. That was the original Comics and Comics store. Oh, wow. Okay. Which is across the street from the closed down. Uh, oh, there was a big bookstore on the corner there. Mm-hmm. Anyways, so tell us about starting the I'm, best of two worlds. I mean, what uh, did you go in there thinking? Okay, I have some experience um, with comics since the late '60s. Um, I co-ran some stores before. I want to do this my way. What were some things you uh, instituted into your own comic shop at that time? Oh, I always been dependent upon, uh, in my mind, on back issue sales. Okay, on turning people on to older previously published things that might be cool to read uh-huh. that they could enjoy. Right. Right. You know, and, uh, you know, I mean, selling nice copies, but then teaching people how to hold a comic book. So they don't put spine bends into the books. Okay. And all that other stuff. I mean, that's just, um, tell know, us, uh, um, t- tell us about, um, running best of two worlds and, uh, some, uh, some of the stories that went on there in the, well, in the late seventies. That's the truth. So it's like, Mostly any other comic book store getting cranked up and things like this. I I looked upon new comics as a necessary evil uh-huh. in the scheme of things of what I wanted to do running running a business. Uh-huh. I, I had lost my job at Kaiser Hospital since so I had stopped going to school because I I stopped doing comics and gone back to college at I Hayward see. State. Okay, so in '75, when you left Comics and Comics, you went to college for a bit, and then you worked as a security guard. For, at I, I, I went there for a year for for two semesters, the, the last half of '75 uh, and the first okay. part of '76. And so, working as a security guard is what kind of funded all that. Is that correct? Uh, it was a nighttime thing where I could study all night long. It was, you know, Kaiser Hospital out at Walnut Creek. Oh, okay. I, see. I, I mean, it's like you. You know, the only thing really competing was the crickets. You know, so at night. How did you pull yourself, pull your resources together to create Best of Two Worlds? Then I had no comic books virtually to speak of that I wanted to sell left. Uh-huh. I pumped all my previous resources into the comics and comics thing. Okay, I never started out to be in the comic book business ever. This uh-huh. always was a hobby that got way out of hand a long time ago. I see. Um, it kind of I, uh, kind of possessed I, your life in a way. When I went to it's uh, learning new comic 
book characters being drawn by certain people that I liked. Uh huh. And then that expanding into the comic strips and then discovering, you know, comic movies going back, cartoons going back to 1908. Uh huh. Um, discovering comic strip stuff from the late 1890s. And I was just discovering this kind of stuff early on. Okay. Um, but they weren't fitting into any of the, uh, the, the few comics history books that were out then. And as more of those came out and then as the overstreet started growing, you know, there, it's been always, there's always been a, um, dichotomy. It's always been a yin and yang. It's always been a, 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 a pull of sorts between people that have a love for what's inside the books and then communicating about, you know, who draw what and how they did it and why they might have done it this way or that way or versus people that entered the business that only got into it to make money. Okay, I and see. That was never my approach. I mean, th that yeah. last part was their approach. I mean, it was buying deals, buying collections, buying people's stuff up, running ads. Uh, early on when I first started get, getting comics, in 1966, uh, older stuff, 1965-66, I was knocking on doors here in Fremont, Nebraska in junior high school. There were some people giving me their old comics right? so they wouldn't be thrown away. So, And then, you know, discovering Prince Valiant by Hal Foster and then discovering that, you know, guys like Frank Frazetta were being inspired by Hal Foster. Then somebody like Mike Kaluta come along years later, and he's inspired by Hal Foster and Frazetta, you know, same with Bernie Wrightson, you know, on and on and on you can go, and it's like and just going back right. through the decades. But in terms of getting back into the comic book business, I had no comics, but there were wholesaler ad ads running in the buyer's guide, the buyer's guide that Alan Light was still publishing back then in the mid-'70s. Okay. Um, that uh, there was all this affidavit return fraud stuff, ultimately, where there were people, there was a guy offering 10,000 comic lots for a nickel apiece, mm -hmm. basically $1,000. Mm -hmm. So, I, I, shit, I, I can, new comics were selling upwards of 35 cents at the time. I figured I pay a nickel apiece for these books, I just go out to the flea market and sell them five for a dollar. I'm getting, I'm making 400% profit. <laughs> from one direction i gotta hustle a lot of dollars to make a hundred dollars a week to live on so this is happening in 1975 yeah and then and, and then that's through the summer of, of no 76 76 okay so this is before best of two worlds started well, best, this is, yeah this is the month the, the few months doing the before. alameda flea market on, on weekends and then and it started raining so i needed a indoor place so Hey, Ashbury was cheap enough. It was a hundred dollars a month. Rented the place. Uh, at first, my wife Susan and I were gonna open up, try to open up over on Clement Street, mm -hmm. which in San Francisco was over in the Richmond District, which was over on the north side of Golden Gate Park, which was uh, more, uh, you might say, affluent upper crust, like being in New York City on the Upper West Side uh -huh. type of mentality. Um, so more, it was, the rents were a lot higher, but also the theoretical quality of persons with money in their pocket walking on the sidewalk was higher. All that nonsense, all that psychological stuff. Um, but then somebody else offered more, more money for this place to rent. So we didn't get it. So we ended up over and opening up over in the hate told the people I'd have that hundred dollars the first week. I had it the first day. I made 129 bucks. Okay. And then uh, took that money and then went over to Golden Gate. Because when I opened up, these were all just long boxes. 10,000 books, maybe like 200 books per long box. Uh -huh. However many 50 long boxes that was. Okay. On the floor with a card table and a chair with a cigar box. Literally starting off again, all over again with nothing. After And then... And then Golden Gate News Agency, and then there's Gill Boys over in Oakland for, for new comics. By this time, new comics were being wholesaled out from these from those ID distributors at 30% off, 
with uh, uh, no returns, and which you could pick and choose what you wanted. And then there was the pre-ordering from the the few distributors there were out there. There was Seagate out there. I'm unclear on how you started your comic, your best of two worlds, because you're saying you got $129 and then you used that to invest in a store. I'm, I'm just well, no, no, I, 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 something in between, I think. I, 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 well, I mean, the first day I took in $129, I was, I was taking in over a hundred bucks a day right off the get go. Okay. All right. right off the get go. Oh. People started bringing in old comics to sell me at best of two worlds. At, at my location, just having yeah, a right, right. people were bringing stuff in. They were bringing in old, you know, Fillmore Avalon concert posters. I started dealing those right off the bat and the comic book stuff and um, started buying things out of the Buyer's Guide okay. magazine. I mean, I mean, just buying things, calling up but, somebody but it, have I a guess... full page of stuff for sale and I'd call them up and say, hey, it, So you it, were kind it, of it, hunting, I, you were hunting down product and people and then basically then wheeling and dealing and getting it and generating money for the store it and creating the store court press starting from the get-go and stuff like this and then uh in november there there were various there were once a month shows in hollywood that i started going down to those and it was one day shows on a sunday and uh -huh. and you know scoring stuff there trading things um, letting go, you know, figuring out what, what I truly didn't need to have at my house uh, in, in terms of whatever comic book collection I, I did have left, and also the, the original art that I had in comics. Okay, there you go. I mean, it, it, I was dealing original art in the Bay Area when virtually no other comic book store dealer was doing that. I see. So the, uh, those are so that's one of the ingredients that made Best of Two Worlds successful. Is that correct? Just one of the ingredients. Right. Um, by May of 1977, when my partners moved up the street, uh, our landlord Robert Ellsworth <coughs> at the original location at 2512 Telegraph Avenue, he didn't even know that I wasn't a partner anymore. So when they were moved up the street. I rented the place from him. Uh -huh. So they were one 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 morning they were moving their last boxes out that very afternoon. I was moving my first boxes, but my, my first van load came into the place. Okay, I gotcha. The first months there, I, I, I painted off. It's it had painted. We had comics and comics painted as a logo in red on a white background above it. I just painted over the. Uh, ampersand and comic cum ix and right just had comics in there and then a friend of mine painted in best of two worlds with pogo with a lantern which he took off of the front cover of 10 ever, ever loving blue eyed years with uh walt kelly uh-huh big, big white pogo book but his, pogo's got a lantern it's a really neat cover huh. okay and uh um so that was may of 77 Okay. And and then um uh, right around then is when um Jeepers. Chris Claremont writing X Men, John Byrne starts doing his first X Men. Okay. With X Men one oh eight. Right. If I remember correctly, that was in nineteen seventy seven. Uh huh. Because uh one oh eight by number one fourteen now. Because opening up over in comics and comics, they were heavily into the, the new stuff. They knew the new stuff market. They never understood the back issue market. When I first opened up, there were just casual people who didn't know any of the backyard stuff. Mm -hmm. Didn't even know that I was no longer a partner there. So there was a lot of people convinced I was the comics and comics back issue annex. Oh, I see. Because that's what that was one of the uh, key things you were providing that maybe other stores were not. Um, not the comics and comic stores, but back then and there were still not that many comic book stores in the Bay Area. Right Even now, um, by seventy-seven, there there wasn't that many. Tell the audience about nineteen seventy-eight. You're at Best of Two Worlds, and you almost died. Tell us that story. That's a really interesting one. 
I mean, when the guy, uh, when I caught a shoplifter. Right. Tell us a shoplifter story. The neat thing about that location we had at 2512 Telegraph uh, was that when you come off the three, four blocks off the UC Berkeley campus up from Bancroft coming down to Dwight Way, there's an island in the middle, but that's like a major, I mean, that's a major uh, bus uh -huh. uh, stop. Right, right outside the front door, but people would like be looking at their bus coming through every ten minutes or so. So I just there was all always all day long attempts at shoplifting, and this one guy I just saw brazenly put a brand new Conan uh, edition of paperback Frazetta cover paperback he'd been looking at, just put it in his back pocket and started walking towards the front door. Okay. And I thought to myself, what the fuck? You know, so I uh, <laughs> come around kind of slap slowly behind him. And as he gets to the front door, I put my boot up in his rear end and give him a big old kick. He road rashes out onto the sidewalk on his uh, wrists and his knees. Uh -huh. And about 20 minutes later, he comes walk coming back in the store and sticks a pistol in my face. Wow. Calling me a bourgeoisie capitalist pig. What do you think of that, Jim? I all right. This is so such a stupid question, but which? which do you remember which cover it was? Was it the Frost Giant's daughter one? I, I just uh, want to know. Remember, I can't remember. I've been actually trying to remember that. The first one that Frazetta had done was was the Conan standing on the big pile of dead bodies. Yeah. Right. Right. And then the second one. These are the first two that come out. The second one was Hour of the Dragon, that the one, only novel that he did. Where Conan's on top of a horse, jumping over a bunch of people in the battle lines. Remember uh -huh. that one? And he's yes. got his arms up above, and the shield and his sword, and and, he, and he's hacking in a human. <laughs> it, it's, it's one of those two. I'm, I'm leaning towards the one the guy standing on the pile of dead bodies because that's the coolest one. Oh yeah, yeah. that's great. I, I, mean, I, it's, I love it's that. All, it's all pure Howard because the later ones. Have Lynn Carter and and uh, El Sprague de Camp finishing up skeleton stories that Howard had started. Yeah, right. and right. and they're okay, but they're not pure Howard. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, so then what happened? Okay, the guy called you a bourgeoisie. Well, he's got this gun. Day. It's like a, an inch from my nose. It's an inch from my nose, and I figure I'm going to die. So I look at him right in the eyeball, and I'm going, "You're stupider than you look. You're going to go to jail for the rest of your life over a two dollar paperback." You right. are, you know, I said some deleted expletives uh -huh. that nobody really needs to hear at this point right now, uh, uh, of de describing various aspects of his anatomy and things, and uh, reached down and punched 911 and pulled the phone up to my ear and yelled into it, comic book store, come quick, there's a guy with a gun in my face. <laughs> and he starts immediately yelling, hang up the phone, and the cops on the phone he says don't hang up don't give in and this goes on for like a minute and a half i mean i figure i'm already dead so i'm just right. playing out the game until i'm go. gone uh -huh. i mean I, i'd already like uh you know it's like i mean all life is random i mean you know, who, who lives who dies so i figured my time's up so about about a minute 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 and a half later the police the guy cop goes okay what's he wearing describe him to me and i go he's I go, I can't tell you what he's wearing. I mean, I can't tell you that. He'll shoot me. Right. He says, well, there's four Berkeley police officers out there with pump shotguns. They don't want to hit the wrong person. Wow. So, well, you were the one you were the one on the telephone. How how hard was it to figure out? <laughs> See that? No, Jim, oh, there, there were other that. people. There was like 30, 40 other people in the store. Oh. This was a busy store. This store was open at 9 a.m. till midnight, seven days a week. And I didn't realize that there were other people no, in the no, store. No, no, no. I thought it was Avenue just you guys. was flooded out with people on Saturdays from Bancroft, from, from Dwight Way, where the store was, all the way to the campus on Bancroft. The city of Berkeley would shut the streets down. You couldn't drive for that four-block stretch. Right. I mean, no, it was wall-to-wall -wall people. I mean, it's just, I mean whatever is ha happening now is not the same as what was 40 years ago. Right. Telegraph was, was, you know, there was a lot of uh, disenchanted, the Vietnam vets were um, you know, street people and stuff like this. That's what a lot of Vietnam vets that were committing suicide 
nobody, none of these people were getting help. Right. Okay. You know, I mean, there were a lot of damaged Vietnam vets. I mean, I remember when we first opened up back in '72, the Center for Independent Living for people in, in wheelchairs uh-huh. was started by a guy named Larry Biscamp, um, a Vietnam vet, was um, paraplegic. I mean, he, he had he was paralyzed from the waist down in a wheelchair. Yes. And the the, the curbs around there in Dwight Way at that intersection at Dwight Way and Telegraph all, all uh-huh. those intersections they were all really high curbs so he and, and another friend i forget the other guy's friend's name because that guy later started helped start normal also right uh i kind of can't remember his name because he actually used to work for me too later on they did the first ten thousand dollar grant for wheelchair accessibility for lowering and making wheelchair accessible all the different corners at Dwight Wayne Telegraph mm-hmm. so this guy could park up at the parking lot, come down and get across the island and then come across the street in his wheelchair to get to the comic book store. I see. And that's the beginning of Center for Independent Living in the state of California. I see, okay. All these curbs to be wheelchair, you know, to, to look, flatten them accessible, out. Accessible, yeah. Anyways. So that then, traces back to the origin of comics and comics. There you go. <laughs> so, so the then, things in the world that would happen. So then now, so this the guy's cops got this trying to figure out. And yeah, the, and the cops going. The cops going. Well, what's he wearing? Like long blonde hair, blue jeans, green army jacket. Give me something to go on. I go. So I look at the guy with the gun in my face. I go. Oh, there's four Berkeley cops out there with pump shotguns. Right. Well. Tell him to blow his kneecaps off so he bleeds out slowly. And then I describe him. And the guy puts the gun down when the Berkeley police start coming in with their shotguns drawn. Oh, wow. I mean, it was... And then a, and then a Berkeley So he, police, didn't, he didn't try to take you guys hostage to get out? I mean... Hadn't he seen Dog Day Afternoon? That was that was like outright around that time. <laughs> it was quite the. I didn't even realize what was happening. Attica, Attica, so Attica, after man. It was all over it, and I'm going, "What the fuck did I just do?" Yeah, I stared down this guy. He could have blown my head off at any second through this whole trip. Right. Well, I know what you were doing. You were busy being a bourgeois capitalist pig. That's what there, I, there you go. You defined what you were doing. Dollar Conan paperback. <laughs> you get a, you know. <laughs> we know what you were doing. Um, well, that's a that's a pretty cool story. So then he what he was under. They arrested him. Then clearly he was arrested. He's taken. Yeah, I never saw him again. Okay. All right. So you didn't feel like uh, Stockholm syndrome symptoms after that? No, 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 no. I was just. Patty Hearst, Patty Hearst, you didn't oh, become you, you didn't go. become Good like uh, Patty Hearst in any of this, huh? I, w- I wasn't hostage long enough. We're talking this whole thing was in and out when, in, you know, basically under fifteen minutes. Well, Jim knows about me. It doesn't take me long to develop Stockholm syndrome with people. So, <laughs> no, uh, no, I, I, I uh, God, I was pissed off. I think I just smoked a joint and went on to my next store. <laughs> <laughs> just another day in the life of, just another uh, day on telegraph avenue it's, that's you have right no idea the warfare well, when we first opened up the berkeley police were convinced we were a major drug smuggler um that that ties in directly with with what happened uh, because the berkeley police officers late years later with this guy with the gun in my face he, he uh, uh a lieutenant had to take the report and after we were all done he says you know, when you guys, that first couple months you guys were opened up, you guys cost the city of Berkeley a lot of money because they had plainclothes police officers. They were tapping oh, okay. their phones. I, I made a, I got tired of, I could tell the phone was being tapped, and I was telling my partner, John Barrett, that. And So after a few months, I started describing a mythical major, major dope deal going down at the parking lot between Spangler's and Brennan's coming off the University Avenue exit at 11 o'clock Sunday night. And evidently, they believed me, and they they brought in 60 police officers on weekend overtime. I mean, deputy sheriffs from other counties, other off-duty police, and they ringed this whole thing and waited all night long. This lieutenant had been a sergeant at the time. He's one of the guys there. We were laughing about it later. Interesting. But, you know, but 
when Nixon was reelected, the street riots on that street in November of 72 uh-huh. was the last major street riot on Telegraph Avenue. That's the last time that the Bank of America, you know, Molotov cocktails were thrown through their windows. Wow. And, and those bourgeoisie capitals. About, about 40 or so of our customers were out front protecting our windows the next morning when that was all over with. And, there was, you know, tear gas had been shot off all night long, and People's Park was just around the corner from our store uh-huh. across the street behind Shakespeare's uh, and the Mediterranean Cafe, etc. And then later on, my other... But anyways, uh, uh, our store and one other store were the only stores left with their windows not broken. Oh, that's cool. Everything you guys had was uh... all smashed in. Because you guys were connected with the underground, so you were we, cool. No, we were con- connecting with our customers, the UC Berkeley students. That, right, uh, that's what I mean, yeah. Okay. You know, Will Eisner had uh, had given me the idea for putting a comic book store as close to a, uh, a college, u- major university campus as possible. Yeah. He, uh, he had said this to me earlier in, in June of 72, at, at his second comic book show in Oklahoma City, that you know all these Marvel all these teenage comic book readers of the 1960s that were captured were uh-huh. now discovering Robert Crumb and Gilbert Shelton, and they were going to college campuses. Well, you, you got to go to where the customers are. Yes. You can't put, just open up something and expect the customers to come to you. You got to go to where they are. That's right. So we had a conversation about creating new customers that didn't realize they wanted to be comic book readers. Right. Which is what the new... The comic book trip of today with the CGC thing and everything is, they've lost sight of that. Uh huh. I mean, it's I, like I work with grade schools and junior high schools, um, giving out free comics, teaching, you know, it, it, putting in the incentive of comics are fun to read. They're a reward in stuff like this, not right. slapping them up and not touching them and being afraid of getting a fingerprint on a corner or something. Um, yeah, I want to talk about this part a lot. Bob, when we get to, like, through the chronology... We will later I, on, because it, I, I've got a lot of views from over half a century of dealing old comics and teaching people why they want to collect this. The right. thing, you know, people that weren't normally reading comics would become comic book customers. Right, and right, right. Not necessarily doing that with superhero stuff. Right. Except for the phenomena that started off... In 1977, with X-Men 108, and then by number 114, I had built up my... That was We're coming into 1978 now and stuff like this. Number 114 pre-ordered. Pre-ordered 10,000 of an issue, sort of. Uh, uh-huh. And that's... But when, if you look at the sales numbers, statement of circulation for that year, it right. says 144,000 copies or something like that. Yeah. So comic book dealers of today, they don't believe me, you know, because I'm just this old, tired, burned out hippie, you know, dinosaur or whatever and stuff like this. <laughs> I was buying like a major percentage of the print run all by myself. That's pretty cool. All these other guys were selling out. And, you know, a, a year or so later, it could start coming in about the time when, uh, uh Phoenix dies in 137 and stuff like that. The ones in the one teens were selling for 10 bucks each retailing. Yeah. Yeah. That's what other dealers were charging. Uh-huh. Well, see, I was with all these other dealers. I was getting in their Spider-Man ones and their fantastic four ones, their X-Men ones, a 57s golden age, you know, action, Superman, Batman's military's black Hawks, uh, hangman, MLJs, old timelies and stuff in trade for John Byrne X-Men's. Right. So, oh, wow. One of those one teens would cost me 17 cents for the 35 cent cover price, but I was getting $10 a piece in trade off of a 17 cent investment. Wow. So maybe say fantastic four. Number one, say what at that point in time was say was a $200 comic book for a VG plot, you know, five, 5.0 yeah. or something. Right. Say $200, okay? Uh-huh. So X-Men's in the one teens, that's what they could sell. These, these new guys starting out, that's what they could sell. So, because, you know, they were, they were running off of the ads in the, in, the, in the Marvel comics. That's what these guys were asking for these books out in the 
Marvel Comics at the little classified ads, and then those Mile High started running ads, and then other people started running ads. Also, uh, American Entertainment out of Virginia, um, etc. But so, so what? What is that? Ten times a dollar seventy. So I, I get a Fantastic Four number one, two hundred dollar book. It cost me three dollars and forty cents. My yeah. cash outlay, looking at those X Men's. Those X Men's are. Part of that was luck. Part of that was having confidence in the merchandise of selling comic books by the creator and huh. not by the company and not by the character. Interesting. And that, that's the key to a successful comics dealing thing is you sell it's sell it's like you got publishers like, you know, Simon and Schuster or say JP Putnam. You don't sell books by Putnam, or if they're Siegel and Schuster, Simon and Schuster books, you sell them if it's Tom Clancy or whoever that author might be. Jay right. or Martin, they're buying books by that author, by those, by that creator. Right, following the creator, exactly. Anyways, that's how I did it. I mean, it, I mean that, that's how uh, the ones that became successful, the ones, other people that worked for me that opened up their own comic book stores like that. That guy over on Divisadero, yeah, Brian Hibbs at Comics Experience. He, he thinks, you know, right in Tilton and Woodmills, and, and it's like, I'm the guy that taught him. Why do people buy comic books? What is the psychology of the comic book collector? What I discovered was the average comic book collector has taken as a group, taken as a whole, are some of the most defensive people on the face of the planet. On average, it's not true, and you know it goes in either directions. So based off of that, because we're already de being defensive from the simple fact of reading comic books. Right, right, that's right. Tell us about Common Ground Distributors. That was a sub distributor that you owned until 1982. Tell us what what was that? How'd you get into that? To uh, increase numbers. So I could get my books cheaper. Okay. I called it common ground because I wasn't seeking to make a profit off of the distribution. There were so few stores back then that there wasn't that many distributors. The organization of what we came to call the direct market doesn't happen until the 1980s. Uh -huh. Prior to 19, summer of 1979, the focus of what you could call the direct market as far as code comics is concerned it was aimed at comic book speculators right that served to function as is it uh the concept of um affidavit return fraud started decreasing drastically at the ids who didn't want to carry comic books in the first place phil Sillinga uh, gets the first comics code distributorship with seagate uh -huh. uh, donahoe brothers out of detroit area Carmen Infantino opened those, him up. Um, that, they were the second ones. Uh -huh. The Shanus brothers were Pacific Comics. They were the third to open oh. up Marvel in D.C. A lot of these distributors, just these sub-distributors, started up as, as a single store. And to keep increasing getting there, it's kind of like Amway, in a way. Think Amway. The earliest Amway marketing techniques. Because you're buying non-returnable there also, back uh -huh. then. Okay. Um, and you're a store, you open up, you're getting 40% off from Phil Sewing. If you sell another, say, $400 worth of stuff, you can get 45 off. Uh -huh. So you, you in turn, or maybe you get, then you work it up and you get 50 off. And well, then you're still selling. And then you, you get some heavy hitter speculators working with you, buying from you. Say they're spending a couple. So you give them 40 off, and you're getting 50 off, and you just slowly build up the numbers that way. This is how this all got up off the ground really slow. I see. In the summer of 1979, um, James Galton had recently become president of Marvel Comics. Yes. Uh, trying to remember the vice president of finance. Ernie Kaplan, uh, Barry Kaplan. Okay. Barry Kaplan sounds right. Uh -huh. And Jim Shooter had recently had, by this point, 1980s, 
79. He had just recently become editor-in-chief of Marvel Comics. Chuck claims major credit for all of this in that, you know, he made some phone calls. It was set during one of the days of San Diego Comic-Con. Marvel called a special meeting. It was a small room. It was maybe 60 of us in there. The room was so small that I'd say a good half the people were standing up against the back wall because there wasn't enough. There wasn't room to put enough chairs in the in there. I see. They got more people than they thought they would. So the entire this was supposed to be all the heavy hitters of the direct market. We're talking right. six, sixty bodies in this room. Okay, interesting. That was, and one of the things that James Galton said during there, they, they were interested in exploring the attributes of, of selling direct like this. And one one of the things James Galton said then was that this is 1979, so at this point, there had been six years of comic books being sold non-returnable, this, you know, budding system. Um, and, and they said we were 5% of Marvel sales. 5%. You know what Best of Two Worlds was? No. The entire direct sales oh. thing... I Phil see. Suing, Pacific uh, Comics, the Andy, actual direct uh, sales uh, was, Rapids, was 5%. Who, who, okay. Whoever was was in, in there by summer of 1979, we were Mar- we were less than 5% of Marvel's sales. Oh, sales. I see. Uh-huh. Their profit. I mean, you know, I mean, they're, 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 their cash flow. Yes. That's what they said. Okay. A lot of things were said back and forth. It was a good meeting. Uh, Marvel, at one point, they asked, well, James Galton asked, well, what can Marvel do for you guys? And then everybody started shouting out all at the same time. And 60 people talking at the same time. Nobody was getting heard. And then shouting over the top of everybody was Steve Shanus. And he started shouting, give us a book. Yeah. And he goes, give us a book. Uh-huh. And he was talking about, and so everybody got real quiet. I mean, like, all of a sudden you could hear a pin drop in the thing. And Steve said, show us, let us show you what we can do. Give us, you know, crank up a, a two, three books that are exclusive to this direct market. And that's where uh, um, Kazar, number one, Brent Anderson, uh-huh. becomes exclusive sure. only. Uh, Moon Knight, number 15. Yeah. Um, is the first exclusive. I, mean, I can't remember what the third Marvel one was. I remember the first DC one was a Superboy one shot spectacular. Uh huh. That was their first direct only. Fucking reprints. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it bombed. Uh-huh. I don't know why. You know, it's like DC with regards to all of this building into the comics world. DC seemed to have their head up their rear end most of the time. Yeah, more of a clumsier approach. That's true. Well, the whole reason why Marvel Comics became more collectible than DC Comics back in the 60s and 70s is a simple thing that all these historians with all their fancy theories don't stop to ponder. And it's so damn simple. Is It started you know, April 1966. The very first classified ad appeared in a Marvel comic Concerning sending off for a price guide. A couple I months see. later, GB Love with Rock RBCC, Rockets Blast Comic Collector, Adzine, becomes the second person to you send off a dollar. You get a Illustrated Comic Collector's Handbook number two and a Adzine, RBCC. And so I got my first one was number 45. That was May of 1966. It showed up in the mail. I was already advertising by 47. But it's so simple as Marvel had these classified ads. Uh-huh. And I forget the guy's name now that ran the classified ad section. Um, DC Comics didn't start up classified ads until 1975, nine years later. What I found out from Paul Levitz, because the guy just died here last month, month or so ago, uh-huh. this advertising manager moved from Marvel over to D.C. The first thing, in 1975, the first thing he started was classified advertising. Prior to that, you had to buy a half page in D.C. comics. I see. By 1968-69, inside RBCC and elsewhere, we were shouting, uh, 
the concept of the Marvel zombie had invaded fandom. Right. You've mentioned, I've, I've seen you mention that before. The only reason yeah. was, I mean, DCs were as superior as all this nonsense, they, all these interconnected stories. I couldn't stand most of those Marvel stories because they were derivative and I shouldn't say most, a lot of the stuff. Um, if it wasn't a Kirby or a Wood or a Ditko, I really wasn't into it. Right. I couldn't get into Larry Lieber. I couldn't get into Don Hatch. I mean, I tried. Uh, Dick Ayers, he was okay, but I really loved him when uh, Severin was inking Dick Ayers. Uh-huh. I like Severin. I'm like Herb Trimpy doing Hulk. I liked it when Severin was inking Herb Trimp a lot. Right. I, I like that Hulk 109 Kazar cover. So it's still one of my all-time classic oh, favorites. That's a, that's a great cover. You know, it's like... But see, I would... People bring in in collections. I would cherry-pick... I knew that that issue of Hulk 109 sold better than the other ones around it. Right. So people would bring stuff in to sell to me. I would make dumb offers on stuff I would knew would sell slow. I didn't want them. I already had copies. But the ones I knew I could turn over easily, like a Hulk 109. Still, it's still a kick-ass issue. I learned yeah. early on, Daredevil 7 is the easiest issue to sell. Barnum. Yeah, it's, it's a good one. Because it's the best one ever done. That's yeah, right. it, it was easier to sell than Daredevil number one. People that have nothing to do with Daredevil were buying Daredevil seven. Yeah, that's well, that's a good one. That's the classic uh, Wallywood Submariner Daredevil. Yeah, but uh, see, I was selling it. I go, I would shove people. What well, you got good to read in here? I would shove it. Check out this Wally Wood. I wouldn't go Daredevil versus Submariner. I go check out this ultra cool Wally Wood. That's right. Okay. Yeah. And then I'd flip them uh, like a weird science eighteen with that those spaceships with all those atomic bombs going off on that uh-huh. book. And so then I would go all off and yeah. I go, here's all this other really cool Wally Wood. You know, and, and, and take that as a parameter of like going off in any direction of right. show, showing people earlier work by, by all these same guys right that makes sense you know so um, like daredevil 7 was like a gateway drug into wally wood before you know it you were probably selling wits end and stuff i mean you had you could do whatever you wanted there you go by using marble yeah totally makes now, sense with this direct sales market early on phil suling had become um publisher right and 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 Sold it, you know, exclusive distributor of, w- of Wally Wood's Witsend. Right. So early on, you know, Phil talks about his, you know, how he got the idea for this direct sales market thing. He talks about it in Shop Talk, uh, Will Eisner interviews that ran in Will Eisner Quarterly. The, they, all those were collected together. Oh, yeah, I got those. Dennis Kitchen put together. Um, I prefer reading reading, reading them in the um, but anyway, Shop Talk's still available. It's it had, went went through several printings, but uh, uh, the, the common ground it was just a way for me to keep increasing my numbers. There you uh, go. So that was then, business. It's a good. I mean, there, there were there were stores. It's like uh, uh, Mike Richardson and his brothers opened up Dream Days comic book stores in Portland, Oregon. Uh huh. About 1985, uh, Mike starts uh, pumping out this stuff out of this company he started called Dark Horse Comics. Right. Um, Richard Finn, who became the Northwest distributor, became a Marvel DC Direct uh, with Second Genesis. I started him out in the business. I mean, uh-huh. but Richard Finn, that was his first supplier. I quickly got outpaced by not being direct. Um, and stuff like this. I sold out Common Ground to Big Rap, uh, not, not Big Rapids, by this time, Mil- Milton Greeps and John Davis, Big Rapids had gone down. Capital City was already in, in motion in, in, by 1982. Uh-huh. That's when I sold Common Ground to, that became their first warehouse outside of the Chicago, Detroit area. Be- so they started their march towards becoming a national distributor. Now, earlier on, around the time that Pacific Comics had been opened up, Bob Sidebottom, comic collector shop in San Jose, he had gotten a Marvel Direct. He I never see. got a DC Direct, but he had a Marvel Direct. Right. And uh, he was grandfathered in. Um, 
he had the best weed. So all those comic book publisher guys huh? at the shows, they, they'd all scope out Bob's side. Anyways, that's a whole other story. I don't know if that should be edited. the best in weed in album. town, man. Hell, anyway, I get you. Uh, so, so uh, uh, side bottom. He's got his Marvel Direct. He in turn is selling to get his numbers because he only he had to buy seven thousand dollars retail of Marvels to become a Marvel Direct. Seven thousand dollars a month. Right, right. So he sold his Marvel Direct to Charles Abar. Bud Plant. Now in nineteen eighty two, that's when Bud Plant. I was I was net, head to toe with Charles Abar. And and I was able to beat him out on some stuff because I was a sub distributor for New Media Urjax and a sub the sub distributor for Capital City and a sub and getting a, an order in from uh, Glenwood. I see, which, which was a, a early one that was headquartered so you, so near you, Sparta, Illinois. So you were a sub distributor for a few places for three, three, for three places, places. all yeah. at the same time. All at I the same could time. never get the front money together. To go direct with Marvel Comics, to get to, you had to pay, you had to demonstrate and be able to pay three months in advance. Yeah. And then you got 45 days credit. Right. You had to show you that, well, it's like any other loan. You had to show you didn't need the money in order to get the money that you needed to operate. That makes sense. Yep. So that's how that, that that's how that was working with, as far as Marvel went. So why did time, it, why did it end in 1982? Uh, Bud Plant had bought Charles Abar. Uh-huh. Uh, in the meantime, you know, Comics and Comics, my ex-partners and I, we were, this is why one of the, I guess what started the name Comic Book Star Wars for this book I'm working on was the street warfare. Literally, we were less than a block apart. So it was like trench warfare in World War One, and we're sitting there how many yards apart, and we're lobbying price wars back and forth at each other yes one price war went on for five months selling books five percent below cost it's about the time comic books were a dollar a piece so every new comic book i was selling i was losing a nickel on I so see. were comics and comics it was because we were selling stuff at you know 60 percent off right and, 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 and losing money and all the speculators started coming in from uh, around the Bay Area. They all started coming in, in into the Bay, it, it, buying books from us. So our sales were going up. Losses were mounting up. They were feeding off of their other comic book stores, trying to knock me off the street. I see. I was feeding off my warehouse that was somewhere between half a million and a million books. Right. Because I never, I was never dependent upon the new comics. Plus, they were closer to campus. So they were selling more new com people coming off the camps. Campus would stop there first, buy new comics, and then see what they missed at my place, and then buy some old ones from me because I had better deals. I see. Right around 1983, I solved that problem. I leapfrogged them and, and moved a, a block closer to campus than they were into the old Sunset Theater. I see. And my new comic book sales just shot up exponentially. I was beating the pants off of them until that warehouse flood destroyed a million comic books. So then, now tell us about, you started to consult for the Overstreet comic book price guide from 1981 until 2013, and other price guides. What type of work did you do exactly? Did you grade and then like estimate how much things were worth? What, what did grade, you do? Grade. I, I was supplying data of uh, artist contents. Okay. I was ah. I was buying so many collections. One year, I found thirty-one comic books, last issues that had not previously been in the guide. I see. Okay. So you helped. You would help them update their guide. Update the guide. Well, Overstreet. I had many conversations with him. The comic book dealing world wasn't that big back then. Right. I mean, you look at the ads. Say, Price Guide Eleven is what you're referring to, I believe. Uh huh. I think right. That's the 1981. Yeah. Well, it started no, in 1970, saying, so probably. Well, no. I think I think number 11, 1981, is the first time that I my name shows up in the credits. When right. did it? When did it first start? Uh, when did When did Overstreet uh, first first start Not, publishing? 
1970s came out five dollars it was a, a white book about the size of the guidebook to comics fandom i have the uh i have the 1976 one that eisner uh did the uh the cover on uh, yeah that's, a, that's got a white cover right yeah it has a white cover 1970s when the first overstreet yes. price came out that's right uh, jerry jerry bales and bob overstreet were 50 50 partners uh -huh. in the first price guide right jerry didn't like the way overstreet was wanted to take it, what direction he wanted to take it in uh because it was you know be becoming obvious that uh there was a lot of min potential manipulation possible here on jacking prices up i see of the so, numbers so there was a price guide number two is actually well is actually a reprint an exact reprint of the first one it's got a blue cover so there's two number ones 1970 and 71 I sent off five dollars for the what was you know he said new edition, and I go, I was pissed off at the time. It's the same damn book, right? So I had, yeah. So I got a you know, a white one and a blue one. Okay, covers, and then and then a red cover came out with for this second one, and that's a perfect bound uh -huh. one. And, and then the this stuff was starting to increase in there, but back then, a lot of us we didn't really want to share what we knew. I don't right. want to tell everybody where all the LB Cole covers were, which books they were on. You know, I'd already learned all this information. You know, which books had secret for Zeta hiding yeah. inside? Those are gems. Oh, yeah. that's interesting. You wanted to keep it a secret so you would find it and, and, and be able to buy it easier? Or, or yeah. why? why? Yeah. I had never thought about that as, as like where, where you guys would be coming from because you had the knowledge. And why give well, it no, to? We were uh, all, you know, we were all just kids back then, and you know, 1972. You know, I was just 20 years old when we opened up that first comics and comic store. So was Bud Plant. We were like tw literally 20 years old. Right. So by the time you get into, we were still in our late 20s. Um, back in the late 70s, this was still a hobby that was trying to figure out and resisting and. A lot of people not figuring out that it was actually turning into big business. Right. See, by by seventy seven here, you know, me, I'm buying, I'm pre ordering ten thousand an issue of these X Men and sticking them in my work in my warehousing space that grew over time. I I had to do three separate moves before I got it to the last place where those million comics were by nineteen eighty six. You didn't tell people that you had big piles of, of comics that you're selling for ten dollars I I, I I i thought of the term in, in a way because it, it's no different but they, they've twisted it even more but see getting these x-men's buying these ten thousand x-men's you know i was also buying quantities non-returnable of a lot of other comics that didn't sell very well right so the x-men's were basically covering say out of a hundred experiments and X Men's one of the good ones. You might have three good ones and ninety seven failures. Yes, that those books just went into the warehouse and or you uh, gave them away. Uh huh. You know, free comic book day. Shit, man. I, I had a spinner <laughs> rack with free comics. You know, given I was giving away every day. Yeah, trying yeah, to yeah. Make people into comic book. I mean, give away free samples. I learned free sampling. We moved back from Saudi Arabia. My father bought the Pepsi Cola distributorship uh -huh. for Dodge County here. Uh, and I'm the first kid in Dodge County. What was I like 12 years old? I was the first kid to drink Mountain Dew in this county. Uh -huh. My father had me standing in hinky dinky grocery stores, age 12, with little two ounce cups, right. handing out free samples. Huh. And there's nothing like warm Mountain Dew that you can see what the color is. Right. I remember a farmer walking up, some old farmer looking at that, really loud. He goes, you want me to drink this horse piss? Yep. God, I was mortified. <laughs> That's hilarious. Is that how you felt about Mountain Dew, Jim? Well, it, it didn't just, I mean, it looked like it, it smelled like it. I, 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 I'd say it, it tasted out, like it. It first came out as Kickapoo Joy Juice right out of the Little Abner comic strip. Yeah. It had it had that big Indian, uh, that big hillbilly, and that little polecat Indian 
on on the the label. I mean, on the bottle. That sounds and like Jim. That sounds like Jim's childhood. You've told me about this and before. It, and Jim. it's a clear bottle. It was a clear bottle. Right. So it went off. It failed. It went off the market. Came back in a green bottle as Mountain Dew, and the advertising campaign was to to get it really cold and drink it out of the bottle. So okay. the advertising was. That's when straws were being introduced. See, now right. America cannot drink without a straw. All these. I was more of straw. a. I was more of a Yahoo man myself, but. Uh, I love yeah, strawberry Yahoo. Never got into chocolate Yahoo, but strawberry Yahoo, yes. Oh yeah, I like wait, that wait. too. Wait, Yahoo's different from Yoohoo, huh? Wait, Yoohoo. Yoohoo, there you go. Okay, yeah. Yoohoo. Make, that's yeah. what I thought. I'm like, Yahoo, that's a website. No, they still make Yoohoo? I think uh, you can still I, get Yoohoo. It yeah, might. I, so. I don't know. I, I, think I, it's I, a, I think it's a West Coast thing because I don't see it around here. I haven't. Seen I don't, I don't see it around. around here, but I know some Midwest people that were drinking it maybe 10 years ago, and that's probably all I know about it. Maybe, well, it, was not, people, maybe it was people that kept it in a bunker. Who knows? Um, so now, okay, so you were rocking and rolling, um, consulting for Overstreet Price Guide, uh, making money. I, re- I originally got listed in the price on the Overstreet Price Guide. Uh-huh. One, one day, uh, my main co-worker guy knew the old comics as he's, uh, Mark Stickman is his name. Now, you, now you're kind of too far from the phone, I think, Bob. Hold on here. I, I'm, I'm just doing something. Now I'm okay. back. All right, cool. And okay. now I'm getting replugged back in. Okay, all right. Okay, now now we're going. Mark Stickman, I, we, we bought a big batch of early '50s comics, late '40s, early '50s, hundreds of them, and it, and it had a, a lot of Hillman issues in it. Airboy with the Heap. It had a lot of uh, uh, Crestwood publications. Okay. And there are also headline comics, Justice Traps the Guilty, and. Pretty much a complete run of Black Magic comics. Right. And wow. Mark's, Mark, Mark's looking at Black Magics, and he comes up, and he goes, Boss, yeah. he's got number 27 in his hand. Yeah. And he goes, I think there's a Steve Ditko story in here. Look at this. What do you right. think? I'm yeah, looking yeah. And I go, God damn, this looks like Ditko. Right. And we're going back and forth, and then I go over to the Charlton's and and, and, and pull out the, the, the 1954 um Charlton, the, the the thing, 12, 13, yeah. 14, 15, and then yeah. cover of 17. Those, uh, those early yeah. 50s Ditko, yeah. So, so, we're, so we're comparing that, and, and, and this Black Magic 27, for years, the Overstreet Price Guide had listed that the first Ditko comic was Fantastic Fears number four or five. I think it's number five. Yeah, uh, from ni- early 1954 is the first Ditko comic, and Bruce Hamilton had written the story, and it was listed that way, and it it broke out and was selling for a couple hundred dollars. And well, here's this Black Magic 27; it's a couple months before, right? It, it goes; it dates back to December 1953, January 1954. Yeah, and then so then we spent the next couple hours. We just kind of stopped the world, and we're going through all these goddamn Black Magics. Just flipping through, panel by panel, page by page, and we figure out number twenty-eight. We discovered together twenty-eight's got a Ditko story also, and that I sent that d- data off to Overstreet, and then he listed me in the price guide that okay. year. Okay. And then I started sending in more notations. It's kind of fun getting your name in there. Prior to that, I didn't really care if I was in the price guide or not. Right. Because no, I mean, your name your name's published and. Uh... Quite a few times in, in, in a lot of different things over many years. So, um, so Overstreet was kind of like your entryway and getting your name out there. Is that is, would that be right as far as getting published? Your no, name published? no. The very first time I was ever in the in the media was uh, January nineteen seventy two. Oh, okay, early January seventy no seventy one uh-huh. nineteen seventy one Omaha World Herald. Uh, I started UNL, University of Nebraska at Lincoln, freshman and a uh, freshman journalism student. Found, you know, I deal in old comic books, and he interviewed me, and they just we sit there bullshitted back and forth, passing a joint back and forth. Uh-huh. And he 
writes up this article and sends it to the Omaha World Herald, and it, it's a two-page, in the Sunday World Herald, it's a two-page spread, in, partially in color. Right. On dealing old comics and <laughs> all kind of, anyways. No, but by uh, l- later on, by the time I'm getting into Overstreet, I'd, we'd already, I'd already been in the San Francisco Chronicle. Oh, Hurricane. I see. But I mean, I guess I, I guess I'm phrasing it more in the world of comic history literature. Is Overstreet well, your was Overstreet your first? <coughs> I, I'd already been putting things into like RBCC and the Buyer's Guide. That's true. As early as 1966. Yeah, and we did talk about um, that last the time. You're right. The, the Overstreet. There were other price guides coming out back then. Okay. I mean, there was four or five other distinct price guides. Yes, yes. GB Love brought his own out, the SFCA price guide. The, the House of Collectibles did one. Um, there's a couple other ones. That's when Overstreet started putting in books that didn't exist. Right. So these other people would come through, and they would uh, <coughs> plagiarize the data on books uh-huh. that didn't exist. Then he'd go into court, bust their ass, and put them out of business. Right. That's how Overstreet put out every other comic book price guide out of business. Interesting. I mean, it, it, it was a, a, a hobby learning how to be a business, is a, if that makes sense. I mean, it's like there were other advertising zines out there with RBCC, and then when Buyer's Guide cranks up, there were other ones that were trying to and were, and failing over, you know, all through the 70s. Uh-huh. George Ol- Olszewski cranked up uh, Collector Dream. Um, Here's one comic source. Uh huh. This is number twenty six. That's put out by uh, a guy that was a former editor of Overstreet. You know, by the time we get into the late eighties, late eighties, like okay. almost a dozen monthly price guides. I mean, right, this thing is like a thing that just got completely stupid. Yeah, I mean, early early nineties, they had Wizard and stuff too. But but see, all that energy was already starting to starting to try coming out in back in the 70s there just wasn't enough comic book stores yet right by the time that 1979 meeting rolls around there's only three there's maybe at the most 300 comic book stores in the entire country i see when we opened up in 72 john barrett and i driving up from san jose one day we counted up and figured out there were 22 other places selling comic books in america that we knew of that we could you could conceivably call a comic book store. There was A1, Jim Payne out of Denver, Colorado. Yeah, yeah. There was Collector's Bookstore down in L.A. I mean, there was Cherokee Bookstore down in L.A. in Hollywood. But that was a bookstore. It was this Cherokee comic section. It was a little back room on the second floor in the back of the... You had to go up these little windy stairs. It wasn't a comic book store. Right. You know, I mean, Bud and John talk about their their Seven Sons thing. I mean... That was like three months in the middle of the summertime. You know, Gary Arlington opening up. You know, he was full service from the get go, and he had, he started out selling comics in an audio video place that he had opened up his own store because the store man, owner of the audio video for like radios and eight track players into your car in the Mission District. You know, the comic book dealing was starting to clog up the store. Right, right, right. So, so Gary opened up the, you know, the first I what I consider the first Bay Area comic book store. Yeah, and, and all those guys from San Jose have gone through conniption fits, trying to, uh, no, 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 we were first, we were first. I'm going. Right. To, I mean, Bob, you, guys already, you guys already did a lot of stuff. It's like, what do you guys got against Gary Arlington? I mean, he opened up first comic book store in the Bay Area. Big deal. Right. It's, you know, Bob, it's going to drive me crazy. Um, the, Moon Knight, uh, Kazar, um, Micronauts was the third one, wasn't it? In the direct no, sales? No, that's later. M- Micronauts is later, I believe. W- w- what year did Micronauts come out? 1980, uh, I thought. Micronauts won. That's January 79. Right. All right. So. That's too early. That's too For, early? Micronauts look, look, is too early. Look up when Kazar is. Uh, April of 81. There we go. April of 81. That's the one I'm on. Yeah, Brent Anderson, number 1 through 15. Oh, okay. So it's it's a- later. April of 81. 
it took a little while because we had the meeting and stuff like this. It took, a, you know, a bit over a year here to before things started happening. The uh, Moon Knight number one. Oh, you know what? I think it is. It's it's that Micronauts didn't start with the first one because I, I, I just Googled uh, 1982. Uh, Marvel goes direct sales only, and there's a picture of Moon Knight, Kazar, and Microdots. What yeah. number? So 1982. So 1982. It's a, it's a bad. It's a bad print. So who's on the see cover? Uh, who, who's the character on the cover? On the Micronauts. Oh, 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 well, of course, yeah. But number twenty-five, Oren Baron Karza. 25 to 29, Nick Fury. They don't peel out the first. Oh, number 30 on. 38 is the first. So, yeah, I think those, I, I mean, I'm just looking at the ad, but that's what I remembered. Yeah, number 38 on. Michael Golden takes over the artwork with number 38. He done 8 through 23, then pencils on 24. Then he does numbers 38 and 39 aimed only at comic book stores. That's Michael Golden was yeah. selling in there. And that's about the time Marvel Fanfare was started out with the slick paper. By the time Dazzler number one is ordered, I ordered 13,000 copies of Dazzler number one. Woo. The most I ever ordered of a book uh, when they Marvel put G.I. Joe on, on to be ordered and they made number one returnable. So I ordered 35,000 copies of G.I. Joe number one. 35,000. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at GCD, and it says that um, Micronauts was preceded as a direct market exclusive the previous month by Kazar the Savage and Moon Knight. The three series were distinguished from the rest of Marvel Color Comics line by having no outside da-da-da-da. So, so yeah, that, that makes sense. It, it's just it's not with number ones. It's not with first issue, so that's why. Uh, well, it's, it, it's Kazar number one, though, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I think so. But it's Micronauts it's, 38. And, and Moon Knight number 15. Yeah. I just had this ex exclusive only. I, I taught Bill Sienkiewicz New Year's Eve night. We talked for a couple hours catching up. Uh, uh, he, I, uh, The guys from Comic Fest asked me if I would... Uh, Bill, Bill was kind of being on the fence about doing the San, San Diego Comic Fest. Yeah, are you going to go this year? I think so. I, I think I'm going to be able to finally again. It's a nice show. I went in a couple years ago. I liked it a lot. Well, I, I, went, I went to the first three. Mike Towery and R Richard Alf died here some years back. Alf and Mike Towery, who's the, the chairman of this thing, Comic Fest, they, they were the chairman of San Diego Comic Con number one back in 1970. Right. Comic Fest is put on by the guys that started comics, comic uh, San Diego Comic Con, and now it's taken on a little life of its own. I, I went to the first three, and then I got wrapped up with Katie. It's just I fell off the boat with everything. Right. I know Royer is going to go to the Comic Fest, San Diego Comic yeah, Fest. Yeah, he, he goes every year. But see, yeah. I know Mike since. Jesus, since 1970. <laughs> right. Arlen, right. Arlen, Arlen Schumer's given four video conf, uh, video presentations. At Comic Fest? Yeah, at Comic Fest. They just they just um, offered that to like, him. I mean, I got... I mean, Arlen's... I mean, I got nothing that I... I don't think I can learn anything from Arlen. He gets caught up in his, uh, his own enthusiasm, which he some does. people misinterpret as arrogance. He just simply gets caught up in his own enthusiasms. I think he's known for having good, fun presentations. He, he's, a good, he, he's also he's highly defensive. That. He's also highly defensive. Remember I was saying we, we did this study in comics and comics? Right, that comic yeah, fans yeah, are. No, it's like, Arlen fits that. Arlen is highly defensive because he, he's put out views out there that gets attacked, so he gets like you know really defensive of me. If people can show me where this other data is correct, I just change my data then, because that's all I want. That's all I'm right. after. Trying a little to more just, down what little happened. Yeah. I, I, don't I, have an, I don't have an agenda other than that, other than a lot of other people say I have all these agendas. But I, no, I don't.
I don't hate you know, I don't no, I don't hate Stanley. Stanley just simply threw Jack Kirby and Ditko and all these guys under the bus. I got so you. what else is new? Welcome to America. It's called capitalism. It's called bourgeoisie pig. There Robert. you go. <laughs> that's what it's called. That's what you were saying. It's that's what you were. You said back in the seventies. Yeah, because I because cause I got because I got on I got on a shoplifter's case. <laughs> that, that was uh, a that, uh, that's the that's going to be the name of the podcast. Robert Beerbaum, nineteen seventy five to nineteen eighty seven. Capital uh, bourgeoisie capitalist. Pig. Oh, she's capitalist pig. There you go. Um, true. So uh, I, 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 I did once those million comic books went away. I did alter my um, tactics. Yeah, in, right. in terms of dealing comics. Uh huh. Because by that time of the warehouse flood, and I had a million comics. I, I was controlling the Bay Area back issue market. Right. And no doubt about it. I mean, there was a lot of people that were competitors. I would say you know, that were upset with me. They were. I, I would tell people what to do. I would tell people what to charge sometimes. Right. I mean, I pushed my weight around, as it were. <laughs> so, well, yeah, you, 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 you uh, built a lot of clout by then. So now let's talk about that. So 1987, there was um, Best of Two Worlds went out of business because of a flood that happened a year earlier. Yeah, what but we left him. We're not even talking about Frank Miller doing his very first autograph party he ever had. Okay, let's talk about world. that. Yeah, what was that, that 1981 was or something? 1981. See, coming out of X-Men in 77, that energy being built. Okay. That's the, that's the first time now where uh-huh. we had a not- noticeable upwards blip of female readership. Right. Not comic book collectors. Reading X-Men. Yeah, women reading X-Men in 1981, you're saying. No, no, 77, 78, 79. I see, earlier yeah. even. So then, and so, you know, being in tune with, with, with the new comics and stuff like right. this, and then I was ordering more and more, so I wasn't trying to necessarily sell them as brand new books to sell them as back issues right? a little, little bit later. So not not being, de- I was trying to sell them as fast as I could, but not being dependent upon that aspect of it. Yes. For making sure uh, you know the nut got cracked, right? Rents, right. Work, uh, employee wages, all all that stuff. Telephone bill. Um, uh, I see. Because back then, long distance cost a lot of money. Yes. I mean, I remember you know, you know running uh, weekly buyers guides ads, and when I had to make the step into uh, purchasing an eight hundred number, it's fifteen hundred dollars a month for an eight hundred number. Oh, really? Back then, it was a status symbol. If you had an 800 number, right. people, you know, I mean, like, wow, it's like <laughs> you were, you were like, you had to be somebody successful in order to afford an 800 number. Back that makes then. sense. Like a one eight hundred snow job, right? <laughs> that, that was status. One eight one eight hundred bourgeoisie capitalist pig. I don't. Know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, that's. That's the, that's ma- that's when you've made it big. So, well, um, all right. So, 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 so as people were coming in looking for the X Men and stuff, well, people right. were asking, well, "Well, what else is good to read?" Well, uh-huh. showing them this or that, but then new comics coming out, and that's when um, uh, Daredevil, Miller Daredevil's first right. hit my hit, hit my blip, hit my radar uh, with number the second one, one fifty nine, okay. had a green cover. Uh-huh. Uh, underwater and stuff, and I like the cover, so I oh, I put yeah. 150 copies back in in my warehouse, right? Go, thinking, well, fuck, this guy's brand new, you know. <laughs> I like this cover a lot, and then I didn't really hit my radar again until uh, the Hulk crossover issue 163, I think. Right. And now, who's the writer back? McKenzie, then? Roger McKenzie, McKenzie. Michelin, yeah. M- M- McKenzie. Okay, McKenzie's writing. Yeah. So he, he, his, his yeah writing he wrote he wrote the early the Frank Miller penciled issues. Yes. Yeah, and and then and then, uh, but with one sixty eight, it just started changing. It just started changing, and then this Electra comes in, and Miller's starting to write it himself. Yes. By right. one seventy four, uh, now it really starts taking off with one sixty eight. And and I'm just I'm just ahead of the curve, but I'm selling out too yeah. soon for my my own mental purposes. So I start just like when Alan Moore started doing Swamp Thing, and I tuned in with Swamp Thing twenty two. I could on a pre order, 
Yeah. Because 20 and 21 were already ordered. So 22, I doubled my order from number 20. But then when 21 sales happened, and I doubled my 23 order for my 22 order. And then I ordered, doubled the 20 or, 24 order from 23. And I didn't, by the time I got up to Swamp Thing 28, I was ordering 7,000 copies of an issue. Pre-ordered before it even printed. Wow. So, so the, uh, I was doing the same thing with the Miller Daredevils, where I'm obviously not ordering enough. This is going to be, this guy seems like he's going to have a story arc going on for years. Yeah, several yeah. Years. Yeah. So I started doing that doubling thing to find out where new comics sales, they're matched out. And then recent back issue sales where we're, you know, jacking the price up a nickel or so. See, all these books where these books started getting jacked up in price. What they were doing with this direct market, all this stuff being non-returnable, is all the the successes were that were going up in price like that were actually just paying for all the dead stock of all the mistakes that were made that people did want to buy. Right. And there's I don't want to make anybody feel bad, so I won't mention their books of people books that just didn't sell that were way over ordered. I see. So, so uh, Perez is... here's an example. Here's an example. Uh, uh, when Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles come out in early eighties, nineteen eighty four, yeah, I, three thousand copies were printed. I ordered two hundred copies. I figured I could sell two hundred of anything by yes. this point. That's nineteen eighty four. So I sell, I buy those, sell them out, and then they're doing reprints. The books take that book takes off. Then the Saturday morning cartoons got announced. Then the TV. Then the, the, the first right the right. Hasbro or Kenner two in those toys? Yeah, I don't know. The I Ninja Turtles ones, I'm not sure. So, so anyway, so the story. So anyway, so the book's starting to take off. People were looking for the next Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles comic book dealers that guys had gotten in it for the money had no idea. So what was it? Some amazing hamsters, right? Yeah, adolescent. Um, I know adolescent was in the word. I have those uh, radioactive adolescent. Uh, teenage hamsters, something it was like that. Either that or one, one with a similar four name title. Yeah, it was a four name title. Yeah, m- monster, but no, it could have been another title also. But I think it was this hamsters one. It sold like a, like hundreds of thousands of copies. Right, <laughs> and it was shit. That's right. Oh yeah, it was awful. There was no other way to describe it. It was garbage. That things like that would just end up in your back room complete mistakes but you, you tr- you're trying to like go off all this inf- information so yeah to be able to afford to pay for the storage of all the stuff that wasn't selling right um passing on all that information like into overstreet or whatever you know for the longest time a lot of us weren't doing that makes sense um for one thing you know a lot of books were you know, I considered way overpriced in in Overstreet. A lot of books were underpriced. If it was just an average, and then but people wanted to treat it as a Bible. That see, all that goes into back and forth, and round and round and round. I came up with my own price list for all all the stuff that I was selling in my stores. I, I figured out how many copies I had, and and if I wanted to slow down the sales, I would raise the price. Right. If I wanted to speed up the sales. I would. I called it, you know, turning the faucet on and off. Oh, that's on, funny. On, on, on any given thing. Back then, you know, just dealing with, you know, these hundreds of thousands of comics coming through. But Daredevil starts taking off, and then it just become that starts becoming a life of its own. And so, I guess around the time of Daredevil, let's see, around around the time of Daredevil, one seventy seven, one seventy eight, thereabouts. So that's six months in advance before 181's being announced, Miller says he's going to kill somebody major in 181. Right. At this point, uh, I think Mike Friedrich, he's already the sales manager at Marvel. He'd been living in Hayward. He'd been living close by my Berkeley store. I saw him all the time when, when he was publishing Star Reach and stuff. And Plus all those guys working in their... My, Frank Brunner, Jim Starlin, all those guys in those early star reaches, they all lived close by. Right. They were they were regulars in the store all the time. I had a little section where all these artists could put up five, ten dollar sketches 
Well, I wouldn't keep any of the money. They just it would just get that was to get them in the store. So then the customers would be seeing pros, all these underground guys like Spain and S. Clay Wilson. I was selling all these guys' artwork wow. at one time or another. Just five and ten dollar sketches. I mean, I basically um Mike Mignola's first publisher. He started coming in my store when he was going to California College of Arts and Crafts, uh. and he's I'm trading him uh, five dollars in trade for doing box the the boxes that had the back issues and each back issue had its own box. So I would have competitions with all these kids drawing. As you you draw me a better one than what's on there, and I'll give you five dollars in trade, whatever you want one in old comics and I'll put your box, your, your artwork on the box. Cause it yeah. had a plastic bag. It was, you know, it was building all this enthusiasm in the stores in different yeah. ways from other stores and not knowing what the other stores were. It, so I could call him Mike Frederick and then buddy Saunders had called the same day. Funny. I should mention buddy Saunders, but buddy Saunders and my paths have crossed constantly over the years. Uh-huh. Buddy wanted to have Frank Miller at his at for Daredevil 181. Also, we figured out. So Buddy and I talked, and Buddy wanted Frank during Christmas vacation in the Dallas Fort Worth area when all the kids were out of school. I wanted Frank before before Christmas vacation, uh, so before the UC Berkeley campus emptied out and Berkeley turns into a ghost town. Right. So it worked out perfectly. Uh, otherwise buddy and I would have fought over who's going to be first, <laughs> but this worked out perfectly for buddy. And the only advertising I did for this Frank Miller, um, for daredevil, daredevil 181 is I, uh, Tom Morzikowski. Right. I think Richard Brenning also was still living in the Bay area before he went back to work for DC as their editorial director, Richard Brunning. Uh, Cause all these different guys were doing flyer advertising for me. Um, I made up a flyer. We handed it out and then I mailed a flyer to every other comic book store. So by 1981, there was like 80 comic book stores from Joe Carrera down in Santa Cruz up, yeah. to, uh, up to my store up in Santa Rosa. I think there was another store in Santa Rosa called, Paralandra at the time uh-huh. and then there was like a dozen in the bay in the san francisco there were you know some in oakland by this point there was walnut creek and you know there was quake comics out in livermore um where, where the uh isn't livermore where the uh alameda county fairgrounds are yeah right and uh so, i mean so there was like a bunch of stores I, I mailed out a flyer to every one of those other stores this is the saturday before christmas now okay uh-huh Half those comic book stores closed to come get autographs. Right. I had 4,000 people come through in one day between 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. For most of the day, it rained. (laughs) They're standing out in the rain. We were blown away. I had the employees from the other stores over, so the other stores were closed. Everybody was at the Berkeley store. I had to hire eight employees that I could trust to help with crowd control. Right. And it stretched down around the corner. I had a, one guy taking people's coats and everything and putting them off in areas and handing out numbers, a couple guys doing that. And then one guy was having people, where do you want your book signed? Having people take their books out of the plastic bags and put it on top. And then as in, in a few feet more, as they got closer to Frank, I go, the next guy, his job was to, you want it signed on the cover, have it open. If you want it signed on the front, uh, inside, open up the page so Frank doesn't have to open up the page. Right, he right. must have signed his name 25,000 times in one day. That's a lot. That'll hurt your for, wrist. For free. I had to stop it at 9 p.m. He was still going, but his hand was completely red in between the thumb and the first finger. It was completely red in there. <laughs> Poor guy. I stopped and I said, okay, all you people, you want... We're starting again at 10 a.m. tomorrow morning till 3 right. p.m. <laughs> Is it, you saw a lot of up-and-comers in the industry. You mentioned Bill Sienkiewicz, Frank Miller, um, John Byrne, and all those guys. They showed up on your radar. And so now it's 1987, and Best of Two Worlds 
Tell us about the flood and how that led to the end. How open can I be? Coming into 1985, I'd had a partner in my Pier 39 store named Gary Wood. Uh-huh. Uh, I, I, I got to go back to 78, 79, 80, 81 and stuff like this. Long story short, uh, Texas Oil Company bought Pier 39 lease. Uh, they didn't renew the leases on anything they any store that was owned by a black person, any store owned by an Asian, or any store owned by what, quote-unquote, hippie, which I guess okay. I fell into. So they didn't renew any of these leases out at Pier 39. So Gary Wood, I, I made him a partner, half partner in my Berkeley store. I felt good. Anyways, a little bit later, a guy named Robert Borden, B-O-R-D-E-N, Bob Borden, Later on, owned Fantasy Distribution in in San, San Leandro. Okay. Um, he buys out Gary Wood's half, and he and I become partners. At some point, uh, Roy Root had been working for uh, uh, Gambit Game Sto- a gaming store a couple doors down from us on Telegraph there, and uh, that store went out of business. Too much uh, internal. Oh, too many owners and too many employees um, liberating too many pieces of merchandise and not being paid for. We went bankrupt. I hired Rory. At some point here, Bob Borden and I, we needed $8,000. It's coming into 1985 now. And okay. so uh, we, we saw Roy Root had inherited some money. Roy Root's father had opened up the first Ford dealership in the Bay Area back in 1905. And uh, there was 161 heirs. So he had inherited a little bit. Of, all these heirs inherited a little bit of money. Uh, Rory had to happen to have money. So he got 14% for his 8000 bucks. About this time, Comics and Comics was going nuts with their overhead, uh, um, decompartmentalizing out all kinds of, um, oh, shoot, the PR guy and, and uh, Diana Schutz was doing the Telegraph Wire, and they were they were beside themselves with uh, top heavy in middle management, you might say. Um, Rory, having become a partner and stuff like this, he wanted to. He saw my case that he wanted to do a segment of the um, um, business where he was in charge of a, a certain segment. So he talks me into ordering the new. He's going to take over ordering the new comics. Yes. Right around this time, I'd gotten into a fight with, uh, I'd centered around and I was getting all my stuff from Capital City. Uh, we wanted some movement in the terms that Milt Tim Greep wasn't willing to do and stuff like this. So I started talking to Bud Plant, old partner Bud Plant, about switching my whole order over to Bud. Rory takes over ordering the comics. I, in May of 1985, I came in 100% with Bud Plant ordering from him and had a credit of $1,500. By October of 1985, Rory, thinking that all I did was just look at the order form and put numbers down, he didn't add it up, and I wasn't tracking it very well. Long story short, by October of 1985, Best of Two Worlds owed Bud Plant $31,000 in the course of five months. Uh uh-uh. uh, no, no, you know, it's like you go, go fix yourself. This warehouse floods in February 1986, same weekend as Eclipse Comics was washed down the Russian River out of Gurneyville. Cat Ironwood wrote it up in her fit to print column a lot. In yeah, Buyer's Guide. Yeah, extensively yeah. written up. It's extensively documented. Um, my warehouse, the best of tools world's warehouse, was 43 miles south of. Eclipse headquarters, their three-story office house, huge, big, and uh, I mean, this is when uh, it rained all through January of 86, the ground was all saturated, all that snow went into the Saharas where the drifts were 20, 30 feet deep, and then in the middle of February, it melted, and it was like a tsunami came out of the Sahara Nevadas roaring down through northern all of northern california russian river went 57 feet above its flood banks that that weekend uh, a guy there was a guy named bill glass had a comic book store in um one of my wholesale customer in marysville california uh-huh um he and three other customers were rescued by helicopter from the roof of his store 
the water came in so fast. He never got back in business. He never recovered. Warehouse flooding, I was paying Fireman's Fund $13,000 a year for half a million dollar policy. I was thinking with a half a million dollars, I I could restart anything. It didn't matter back then. Having half a million dollars back in 35 years, 35 years ago now? Almost, yeah, that's a yeah. lot. How many millions of dollars would that be in today's equivalent buying power? You know, I don't know. Somebody else, somebody else can do the computation. You know, it would be millions of dollars in today's money. Right, that's true. It, it, just, so anyway, so I, you, know, I can, you can restart your, your gig off of that. And I was paying them 13 grand a year. And this was the first time FEMA was out of the starting block. So FEMA was just converting over in those Reagan years from being a um, nuclear save, a government agency to save the government in case of nuclear warfare. There you go. It was an agency, Federal Emergency Manage Management Agency. This was their very first time starting out of the starting block to help the people because Glasnost was starting up. Gorbachev and Reagan were you know, talking a lot, so the right. nuclear warfare was starting to recede on the horizon uh, in, in, some, in some people's hopeful eyes. Things of that nature. Right. Um, and and uh, um, FEMA, if you had a, at that time, when that first time they, they, they showed up ever in the country to try to handle a federal emergency, if you had an insurance policy, they wouldn't let you sign up for a FEMA recovery loan. So after I was going around and around with Fireman's Fund Insurance Company, they announced to me I had something, there was something called a co-insurance clause in there, which, a long story short, for every dollar they stipulate you're underinsured, they pull a dollar off your net payoff. So they added up everything that was, and figured out some sort of formula that, and they said I was four hundred and sixty-one thousand dollars underinsured. Here's thirty-nine grand. Right. I had showed all the people that were owed money this insurance policy. Don't worry, everybody's going to get paid. One hundred and nine companies wow. were on that Chapter Eleven reorganization. Mike Pate and his lady friend Christine at the time. Anyways, they were doing sleepovers. A bunch of the employees they were talking, and Rory was. I could hear feel things in movement and stuff like this and there's brian hibbs he's working the you know 17 year old i'd taken him in to, as a test for being a manager of the place he was the third person working there the main manager ski mark ford he had beautiful girlfriend had taken had been a ballerina for the oakland ballet she'd taken a job on an exotic cruise ship and he followed her uh when they Police, San Francisco police showed up at my Hate Street store. There had been a uh, hole cut in from the alley. About $25,000 worth of stuff was missing. And the, the cop examining all this about four days after this all happened, there's had been that many murders in San Francisco uh, at, by this point with, with the crack epidemic starting to like really make uh -huh. a lot of shooting going on. Right. Lots. So this is like eighty six. This is eighty six still. Yeah. This is this is a late eighty six. We're going into middle late eighty six at this point. Okay. Okay. Um, Ski Mark Ford. It, it turns out the cops told me that no, no, this was from the inside out. It's it's made to look like it's from the outside in, but this is from the inside out. And then Ski Mark Ford had disappeared. So I I didn't see him till, geez, nineteen ninety five Dallas Fantasy Fair. Right. I ran into Ski Mark Ford there, hiding behind a big, thick, Charlie Manson-looking beard. Uh -huh. Anyways, that's the same one that Steranko did, his five-hour, uh, one, one and a half page, the first one and a half pages of Shield Number One that Katie sat through, that Steranko's never forgotten. <laughs> Why? She goes, Katie sat through six hours of Jim Steranko explaining the first one and a half pages of Shield Number One. <laughs> <laughs> six hours on one and a half pages <laughs> yeah 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 i mean he, he imagine that a, a, analysis is huge with steranko there's no question no 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 I, and i mean that in a good way because jim really gets into it and there's right. a reason why he does stuff and if you really want to learn how to do it then yeah absorb these guys these old guys
Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. Because I'm an old guy trying to pass on my bullshit now, right? Ha! <laughs> so, Tim Wong, who was assistant manager, he'd gotten a scholarship at uh, UC Santa Barbara for engineering. So he, because I want, he said he he couldn't become manager. So that left it to Brian Hibbs, age 17, 18 years old. He tr- it turns into a, I got pictures of of them throwing him throwing parties there. He was beer bottles all over the place. I, I would not bring a family into it. It's like. Anyways, it was like back and forth. I'm dealing with a 17, 18 year old in a Eighth Street store. I've got a warehouse that's flooded out. Uh, I got th- this this minor partner who's okay. and, and doing stupid stuff, and things are disappearing out of the Berkeley stores. The warehouse is being dismantled. Some of the stuff that wasn't maybe twenty percent of the warehouse wasn't outright totally destroyed turn into paper mache bricks I'm, I'm dealing with the fema people they won't let me sign up a thing i'm dealing with the fireman's fund uh at this time i've launched a chapter 11 reorganization the federal judge tells me i need to fund seventy five thousand dollars to fund a chapter the initial funding of my chapter 11 reorganization i go well i can hit that so i start running half off ads in the buyer's guide weekly full-page half-off ads. Re- Rebecca Den was doing this computer work. She was inventory control work on, on a, uh, uh, a PC, uh, typing in everything over $10. So we, we send off printouts every week, uh, a portion of the alphabet, 50% off. I raised $50,000 out of that. Um, I'm trying to sell my Hate Street store for $25,000. Here's the key to the store. Um, this or that person. Then Brian comes in with his dad. They're going to buy the store. Okay. I, I, so they're going to buy the store. Two days before the um, federal deadline for all of this, for the $75,000, and his dad is telling me it's two days before the federal this federal deadline, that money's coming through. I'm going to have it. I'm going to have it. And the next day, he's telling me in the morning, they go down to my landlord's place on market street beaver brothers antiques arnold share was his name um and they say to arnold who didn't even know i had a warehouse flood because his rent the rent went on that store was all paid up why bother why, why have landlords be worried about anything if you don't need to have them worried and they go bob's gonna go out of business can we rent the store when he's gone so arnold calls me up he goes you know that snot nosed kid you got working for his, his, his exact words. You know that snot-nosed kid you got working for you? He, him and his dad were just in here saying, you're going bankrupt out of business. And can they rent the store when you're gone? Right. They've been trying to save the Berkeley store where there was eight people working there. I was looking at it from the aspect of number of jobs. Berkeley was more, at that time, was more fun than the Haight-Ashbury. So when I realized what was going on and it was like shits was disappearing like mad, like crazy out of the Berkeley store, and stuff like this, and stuff like this. I just like, okay, I let the Berkeley store go, and I just went over to the Hate Street store by myself. Rory starts denying being a partner, and all of a sudden, it was like, including Rory, everybody's jumping in to the Labor Relations Board. I owe, I owe all these back wages and stuff. Oh, gosh, okay. You know, some of these people, like Georgie, she uh, actually owed me uh, it had, had advanced out about three hundred dollars on wages in advance. Uh-huh. <laughs> had an you know, but but Christine, the Mike Pate's girlfriend, that she went to work for Ronald Turner for the last bunch of years. She just made up numbers and gave them to the la- labor relations board and stuff like this. I just looked at all of this, and, and then was, and then they were like putting on uh, what I want to call it. Uh, a picket fence out in front of, uh, of that store because they thought I was going to all completely fall apart and they'd end up with the Berkeley store, um, Mike Pate and Roy Root, and and Brian Hibbs would end up with the Haight-Ashbury store. And I'd already flipped the Santa Rosa store over to Bud for the $31,000 debt that Roy would run up. So I handed over the Santa Rosa store over to, over to Bud Bob Borden, in the meantime, he disappears, 
to Chicago and takes a, a, seat, a friend of his gives him a seat on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. So he's gone for two years. He's just gone. So I'm left here holding this bag. Rory's denying being a partner uh, completely whatsoever, which was like crazy bullshit. And then all of a sudden, before I know, then I'm I get this thirty nine grand from a, a fireman's fund. I take it over to a place called Porter and Whitehead. A law firm in San Francisco that was in the Shell building, Shell Oil building, so it's all real skinny building. Anyways, I give them that, that money, and then I, I'm talking to Robert Ellsworth, the old landlord, about funding a lawsuit to fund fi, Sue Fireman's Fund for millions of dollars. Right. Because I'm really pissed off, so he's going to fund my lawsuit. Right up to the point, and I'm going to split it with him 50 50. We're going to sue for like five, ten million dollars uh -huh. for full retail and all that shit that they were like saying was worthless. Because it's still fighting for respect for comic books when you're like dealing on all levels. Cops don't think you're a viable business. Insurance companies, banks, this is not real collateral yet. Thirty years, right, ago. right, right. And it's a whole different mindset from now. Now you can probably get collateral to buy a house with an action one, you know, and not even have to put just here. Put this in the safety deposit box for the bank. You guys now own a piece of the action one. Thank you for my house. I mean, you can use you can use the comic books like that for collateral now for is real money, but you couldn't back then. It just there was no mindset for it yet. I see. So all this is all swirling around. I the the labor relations board person said, just go on vacation for a couple of weeks, and these guys will disappear, and which they did. Um. Robert Ellsworth was funding my lo this lawsuit uh, against Fireman's Fund right up to the point where he discovers that the agent who wrote my policy was an uh, insurance agent over in Albany, California, to, through the Solano Tunnel from Berkeley over to Albany. That is a, a guy that he played golf with. See, he did a 180-degree thing on me, and all of a sudden, I, I'm dealing with a three-day unlawful detainer in that Berkeley store. That's when I just said, okay, all this stuff's going on. I just, like, shut it all down, pushed everybody out, fired everybody out of the Hate Street store, closed it for two weeks, then reopened up, buying comic books from Bob Borden, who had, by this point, had come back and opened up Fantasy Distribution, and going down to Golden Gate Distribution, shoot. Changed my whole mental set. It's like when when the Killing Joke came out in '88. Yeah, it was first published. The first printings got a green color for the Killing Joke on the title. Uh huh. There's a pink one. There's a blue one. There's like five, six, seven printings of it. Anyways, the first printing of that four dollar comic book, I ordered seven thousand copies of it. So I loved Brian Boland, and I saw uh, uh, some advanced pages, including that. That one page with that Joker panel where all those ha-ha-has are going off? Yeah. You know that panel? It, that yeah. panel is just like, I saw that, and I, and I, I loved Brent Boland's work. on. I go, this is going to be a kick-ass seller. A lot of stories are going to run out. What I did, rather than trying to work any kind of um, speculative market at that during that time span of my life, up until Rick Griffin, is I kept all those killing jokes, one per person, at cover price. So here's all these other comic book dealers and stuff like that. They're charging eight, ten dollars for the book. I'm cover price. <laughs> right. But I'm one per person. There were people sending in their grandmas and their aunts and uncles and little sisters coming and buy one copy of this first printing of the killing joke. It was a hot book. This is all leading towards that Batman movie energy. Roy Root I mean, he's passed on about 10 years ago. I mean, he died of a cocaine overdose. I found out that uh, Brian Hibbs was de de directly connected with stealing stuff from his... Uh, one of his friends named John had been doing... Uh, you know, peripherally hanging out there. Right. A couple of years into the thing, he walks me in 100 mint Fillmore Avalon concert posters that he say Brian had given him. Brian was giving away my stuff to his friends. That's stealing. Right. And right. stocking up your own store. It's like if I came into your house and just picked shit out of your kitchen and gave it to somebody else. 
I just came in and just gave them to somebody else. You know, anyways, it goes off in all directions. You got to ask me another question at this point. <laughs> okay, so then the flood, though, then put you under financial stress where you had to close Best of Two Worlds. I uh, closed down the Berkeley store. Right. I kept the Hate ashbury store. I just started working that. I started hiring women into that store. I started how- doing all kinds of different experimentation. I didn't hire a single guy for like three years. So when did the Hate ashbury store close? Oh, 1992, after Rick Griffin was oh. killed. Oh, I see. 92. So you actually had a store till 92. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. I had that Hate ashbury store was from 1976 through 1992. I see. Okay. And Rick's killed in 1991. No, no, no. The hate, well, the hate but, but Rick's death wasn't connected to the closing of the store, right? I lost interest in it. Oh, really? So yeah. you got you were actually depressed from it. Well, yeah, my friend died. I see. And then three weeks after, uh, and then Bill Graham was, um, I'd been doing a lot of negotiating between Rick Griffin and Bill Graham. And also working with Grateful Dead Management, and because uh, Jerry Garcia was a customer, we were going to become Jerry Garcia's art agent. My gallery was going to, all that Jerry Garcia artwork that came on the marketplace in the early 1990s, Right. that was all me set. I set all that up. Yes, uh, okay. other people took advantage. I, I'd done a deal with uh, Apple Records to uh, reprint the August 1966 Beatles Candlestick Park poster. Uh-huh. I had uh, cut a deal with Janis Joplin's um, estate to uh, one, one of her, his her sisters. It was three sisters. They, I, I bought. Uh, I, I was going up against those people that opened up that gallery. I mean, that not gallery. The the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in was it in Cleveland or Cincinnati? Uh huh. Um, I was competing with them before they had got a site, before they had a ground. Uh, they had bid $21,000 on one-third of Janis Joplin's estate, which included one of the sisters. It included nine songs in her own handwriting, um, over 200 posters, about 200 uh, photographs, clothing of hers, jewelry of hers, other personal effects. And I, I bid $25,000 on it. Right. Um, Bill Morrison? Yeah, The Doors. Jim Morrison. Jim, Jim Morrison. Morrison. I've known Bill Morrison since before he started working for Matt Groening. Uh huh. Shoot, I knew Matt Groening when he was still doing, coming into my Hate Street store selling me uh, greeting cards. Right. Before The Simpsons. <laughs> so then, 1992. So you lost interest after Rick Griffin died. And so, what did you do after 1992? Well, the reason why I was bringing up all this peripheral stuff of, of the dead and, and, and Bill Graham is I'd, uh, I had worked out a scenario with, bet- between the, the big five poster artists Rick with, with Rick, centered on this Rick Griffin art gallery that all these other guys that wanted in on. Moscoso, Wes Wilson, Mouse and Kelly, they all showed up with stuff wanting in on this gallery thing, and then all the Zap guys wanted in on it. And, and then the other poster artists, David Singer, uh, Lee Conklin, Bill Graham presents. They solicited us, our gallery for all of, all of, all of the framing. The B- Bill Graming had a framing unit. They were they framed up a couple hundred pieces for us. But I'd had a talk. Me and me and Rick had gone in there to start the framing process. We got word that Bill Graham wanted to talk. I we went up. Me and Rick, God, we were so stoned. Rick insisted we smoked this giant cigar joint uh-huh. in his truck right outside the front door of B- BGP. Then okay. we went in, then we went back, then we went into Bill Graham's office, and I just launched, uh, Rick had been moving up, he had been gotten involved with his Artist Rights Today, ART movement, to try to get partial rights back to their concert poster artists, because they're getting older. Rick was right. like 47 at the time here, okay. so he's starting to realize these guys, these, you know, the, the Jimi Hendrix Flaming Eyeball poster, wanted to be able to do a, a reprint of it and sign them, sell them as, you know, Etc. You know, Graham didn't need the money, so I, I actually once I laid out what we were doing, Graham jumped in, and we were transforming this gallery it was going to be a rock art museum for the Bay Area, where we were going to take over the whole cannery. You ever been down to the cannery before? No. In between, uh, down by Girardelli Square. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah, I, I have. 
you know, I mean, we're, we're going to take over the whole thing. That was that whole block was going to become a rock art museum. Oh. We were gonna, yeah, I have it there. The yeah, Cartoon Art Museum is close museum. there now. Yeah, right on the top floor was going to be was the Earthquake Museum uh-huh. for the city and of city and county of San Francisco. We're going to be with the whole rest of the thing, be an ultimate and then Charlie Brown's seafood restaurant in the place. It would have been a, I mean, like a. a just like the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame that's in Cleveland or Cincinnati, Cleveland now and stuff like that. I was there before they were, were there. Oh, the energy would have been kept in San Francisco is what I'm trying to say. It would have I got built you. out of it. Bill Graham got behind it. He was starting to fund it. Um, three weeks after Rick got killed, Bill Graham got killed. Two weeks after that, I found out my partner, Ed Walker, he'd gone back to Colorado. He wanted to check on his son with cerebral palsy he's told me uh, i got a phone call from a bail bondsman saying rick uh, ed walker was in jail my partner had never in in that gallery he, he told me he was into plastics recycling where i was he, he'd, he'd been buying posters from me uh for some time for quite a few months spending one to three thousand dollars a week in cash on posters well he was laundering money because what it was was a two million dollars worth of uh, stuff from uh, South America. Almost got busted, and, and then the FBI, the DEA, they were had plain clothes on the in the cannery grounds. And then the owner of the cannery, and it got into a really intensely weird situation. Coming out of the uh, um, 1988, um, and, and I'm, I'm working the store by myself, and I, I'd, I'd gotten. I had it at Haight and Masonic, where seven bus lines converge at Haight and Masonic. Okay. Seven bus lines converge all there. And it's a major transfer hub, or it was for Muni back in, back in those days. I don't know about now. But in, coming in 1989, I, I was selling more and more Batman stuff, and, and I, I contacted Paul Levitz. Uh, I tracked down... the. The neatest billboard that you could purchase to rent in the Bay Area back then was before the 89 earthquake, where the Fell Laguna exit used to come off of Highway 101, and, and Fell Street would go all the way to Golden Gate Park. Okay. One, exactly one billboard at Divisadero. Divisadero is called that because it's north-south, it separates and it's a valley that goes through north-south. In San Francisco, it's real easy. There's no hills. They yes. were very few. Right. Anyways, there's this billboard above this mobile station uh, at the corner of Fell and Divisadero. Uh, facing, f- I mean, a- anybody sees it. It's 45 feet long. It's 35 feet tall. It was $4,500 a month. I, I, I called up the uh, place that you rent it from. They says, oh, this already committed to um, uh, Moosehead Beer. And you can only and you can only rent that billboard for two months at a time. So what I did is I called up Moosehead Beer up in Cali- up in Canada, and I told them, "Here's this little comic book store, and put up this Batman billboard. Can I rent this billboard?" And they didn't care. They just took the billboard at another point. So that Batman billboard that I put up, Paul Levitt helped me um, run it through all the legalese and stuff like this. So I got the thing approved in like just record time. Oh, cool. And, this billboard goes up. I end up on every TV station in the Bay Area, every newspaper in the Bay Area. I ended up on every TV station twice. I ended, I ended up with a half a page on a two-page spread about Batman in the San Francisco Chronicle in a, in a light gray box separating out best comics because I'd made a bat cave right. on one-third of the store. I had 371 different Batman products. Okay. That Batman billboard went up. I sold $150,000 in Batman t-shirts the first month, just t-shirts. I had the cars piled out. They were packed out three deep. Remember one day, a a San Francisco, a hook and ladder fire truck, triple parks on blocking the whole intersection out there. Nine guys get off this hook and ladder. They come running into uh, the um, store. Each getting, you know, three extra large Batman T-shirts, and I get them out their way, and then they send them back out. Right. Um, 
that's about the time I re- met Rick Griffin too. He moved in a couple blocks from the the store. He started coming in. I was really disappointed when I got down to Dallas there, and um, Simon Beasley, who Rick had fallen in love with his artwork. Oh. Simon Beasley had never heard of Rick Griffin before. <laughs> so I had this whole fantasy in my head built up of talking with Simon Beasley about Rick Griffin. He had no, he had no, I had no idea who Rick Griffin was. Right. And I'm going, what? <laughs> I remember, well, yeah. Cool. That's, you were, cool. cause, that's okay. Because we both hung out with Beasley a lot this that weekend and you were disappointed by that answer yeah he had no way i didn't know what to say i didn't know what my next statement was going to be because i would wanted to you know get his reaction of like here's rick griffin world-class artist and rick's harassing me to get more beasley artwork so i was like importing out of print stuff i already sold out a couple years earlier from england just for rick because how do you say no to Rick Griffin? I think what we can do, and and I know where, in one of the questions that I'm going to ask you, um, we can at least introduce a notion of what your, your current work is, what, what the project is, and what you want to sure. do with it. Um, it not not go into great detail about it, but just just have it so it's it's in there because I think it's – I don't see how you discuss you without discussing what that's going to be. It seems important to me. When when I moved out of California, when I moved out of California, and and I called up my dad, you know, come get me, uh, need your help, uh, and it comes out and bring a U-Haul truck full of stuff back here, and I still had stuff back there, and I took more van loads over, over the course of time back here, and then I'm okay. What I'm what am I going to do here? And then it's like I had started writing the early portions of comic book store wars, uh, trying to ex- figure out, explain what happened back in the seventies and eighties. But as I was trying to describe the comic book business of the nineties or the eighties or the seventies to explain the seventies, they got to go back to the sixties to ex- explain the sixties. He got to go put roots back into the fifties and back into the forties and back into the thirties. And I was, chugging away in all this and going gung-ho and interviewing all kinds of people and Maggie Thompson, Don Thompson earlier before he died at CBG were running uh, questionnaires and every letter of comment I sent in about data quests, they ran everything I sent in. Some of the stuff they were putting in the buyer's guide in color when I was looking for certain things. Um, and Then, well, let's let's save it for for when we because I've got the just the right segue for you to talk about this when I'm asking you about a uh, historian question. Um, okay. So let's, um, Alex, what? Are, how much? How much we got left on on your stuff? On my stuff, we're good actually, because the only thing left is Obadiah Albuck. But um, you know, I know that uh, that that's a whole thing into itself. So I would say as far as the... Because it, it's the, not just Obadiah Old Buck. There's thousands of comic strips and right. hundreds of publications. Right, right, exactly. So and, this and, and the... And, and, so and my, an my end of it... An audio broadcast of that without showing the stuff is kind of pointless. It'd be no, describing. It'd be describing the various portions of an elephant to a blind person. Right. Because I know I was... People, I would... When I first started researching this really old, early, early old stuff, I hadn't seen it yet. I'm calling up old guys like Gabriel Laterman, lived in New York City. Uh, and he had a copy of 1849 Journey to the Gold Dickens by Jeremiah Saddlebags. And the few people I knew that were into collecting this really early stuff, they were really pulled back with their sharing of data. Right. No, but none of these people wanted to tell anybody. And all the history books that I was looking at, they were all wrong. They were just wrong about, you know, it's like, I, I pull it back, Yellow Kid becoming the first comic strip. I I pinpointed that to Coulton Wog in the comics. Right. That's two paragraphs. And then the Becker book in 1959 quotes Coulton Wog from 1947. 
And then like the Penguin Book of Comics in the mid-60s, it's just quoting Becker and Wong and some of these other books. And then it just kind of built in. And then somehow Famous Funnies becomes the first comic book. Right. And, you know, none of this stuff, none of these people are the first of anything. Phil Silling did not create the direct sales market. So but they were this... all, but they were all superstars. Phil Silling was a superstar. That to, it's hard to explain. Phil, it was, it's like his presence was known inside a room before he ever saw that he was in it. Right. It's hard, it's hard to explain that type of energy in a in a any kind of room, any kind of gathering of people. Yeah, but so uh, but, is... but actually told me that he told me that it, he was a primal force. He he was a true primal force. But he just simply did not create the direct sales market. Right. And Phil has said so himself in that Shop Talk interview with Will, with Will Eisner. Eisner so asked Bob, the point, this, yeah? this is exactly where I wanted to go. So I'm, I'm really glad you're talking about this because um, – I was I was looking at some of your stuff and you were you were talking about uh, the uh, the uh, Joe Schuster Superman cover. Yeah. And and I was reading a, a bit about it and what I'm interested in is not so much comic book history although obviously I'm interested in that but comic book historiography the the study of comics history and in a, in something like that Superman cover I've read like five different versions of the pulling out of the fire and the reason for it being in the fire in the first place. And there's a lot of um, five different versions from me. No, no, not from you at all. It just in, yeah, in terms of different all Superman these other books. places I've seen it reproduced in DC history books. And there's no mention of me or my story from any of those guys, including that uh, Les Daniels book. About Superman, they put in like a little one-inch picture of that first Superman cover, and in other places they don't explain it. They don't explain. I go. That's exactly right. And I'm I'm doing some research on on those guys, uh, Simon and Schuster, um, Siegel and Schuster, in terms of their high school days, and I I'm I find inaccuracies in all of the books um, that that talk about them. And yes. and so what I want to talk about with with you is in terms of comic book history itself, how good a job do you think people have done as historians, and what are your concerns about it, and and who do you think have done really good jobs or the real pioneers, and what can we do as comic book historians to improve our records as historians of of this stuff. Every one of those is extremely loaded questions. <laughs> that's, uh, that's what that's, I'm here for. That's Jim style, man. No, I understand that. But no, that's also uh, what I was analyzing over all these years. Once I, <coughs> I look at it like for the longest time, the ancient city of Sumar, you know, Ur in the, Sum the Sumerian civilization was supposed to be the cradle and everything started there. Writing. Religion, the whole nine yards. And then Gobeki Tepe shows up in Turkey. You studied Go Gobeki Tepe yet? It's, Have it's, I? It's a, it, it's, yeah. a, it's a megalithic site that's at over 12,000 years old. Gobeki Tepe. Yeah. It's in Turkey. It's in, Ang well, Angora actually would, would be the earlier version. Yeah, Gobeki Tepe. And it, it's like they. I, I can't even explain it to you. If you, have, if you know anything about it, I was going to use that as an analogy where comics history had a certain function to it, and, and, and we, we all believed it. I believed Yellow Kid. I believed all that bullshit for years and years and years up until 1998. And a guy named Jay Mader, M A E D E M A E D E R. Jay Mader was a. By the time he died, he was a senior editor at New York Daily News. He was also uh, uh, writing Annie, Little Orphan Annie, that Andrew Peepoy was drawing yep. at the time of his death. Earlier on, he'd done uh, interviews when he was working for the Miami Herald, I think it was. He interviewed uh, uh, Frederick Wortham, uh, some other people that ran an RBCC, because G.B. Love's gig was down in Miami also. But in, anyways, later on, 
And Greg Thixton, I, I was talking with him and staying at this place 20 years ago, and, and Greg introduces me to Jay Mater. Jay Mater has me read a get a hold of a he got get a hold of a thing called American Notes and Queries with a long article letter written by a guy named Gershom Legman. Gershom Legman had written Love and Death in 1948. Um, three chapters in it. Um, Wortham pulled a lot of Legman's stuff out of this Love and Death article, self-published red cover thing, Love and Death. Which I've got a copy kicking around here somewhere. Anyways, uh, uh, there's a long letter in there, and he's writing about with the history of comics and stuff like this, because August Derleth in 1941 had started a comic book thread. American Notes and Queries was like an early, um, oh, somebody would ask a question, and then a couple months later, somebody has, would supply an answer to that question on all kinds of subjects. August Derleth started Arkham House, etc., had, had uh, started a comics thread in 1941. Somewhere in 1944, middle of 44, the, uh, this thread was progressing, and a guy named Clifford Shipton and was talking about the adventures of Ichabod Crane from 1855. As Ameri- he was the head of the New England Antiquarian Society out somewhere in Boston area. And then the magazine stops for a couple of years, and then the next issue, first issue that comes out is January 1946, this long letter. And you know Gershom Legman's got all these comic books, and he's talking about this thing called The Adventures of Obadiah Oldbuck being the very first... American comic book. And he lists out lots and just dozens and dozens of other ones. And I start typing these names of these titles into Usenet, the old Usenet, um, on sure. alts. Comics. Miscellaneous or alt rec arts miscellaneous. You, were you go back on the internet in the mid 90s? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You remember that, that early on? He, the first 25 words was. The internet would only search the first 25 words. You put all your keywords in there. Then you typed your your story, whatever you wanted to type out. But it would only search the first 25 words of the internet. So put all these keywords in. About six months later, a lady from Oakland, California gets a hold of me. And she's got something called Obadiah Old Buck. It had been in her family for seven generations. She had a letter from her grandfather. Don't sell this. It's the first comic book. But she'd oh, had wow. a baby. She'd had a baby. She's a single parent. She needed to buy baby clothes. I had no idea what to offer her. I merely wrote her back. I'm going, Get whatever offer you can from anybody else, I will simply double it. And I'll help you out that way. And a guy named Doug Wheeler, he thought he already had a copy, so he offered her $100. So I ended up buying my first copy for $200. <coughs> this is now early 1999. And I get this thing in, and I'm going to New York. Uh, to a show, and um, Doug Weaver lived in Pennsylvania toward around the Philadelphia area. I pit stop at his place, and turns out he's got a second printing of it. What I have is a first printing, which puts a whole new wrinkle on this matter. Oh, yeah. The reason why I brought up Gold Becky Tepe is you believe Yellow Kids, the first comic strip, original, you know, two Amer- original American art forms, jazz and comics. You know, okay, well, maybe maybe you can make the call for jazz being an original American art form, but when you Europeans been laughing at us for years, arrogant Americans thinking that you know they invented comic strips, bourgeoisie capitalist pigs there creating comics. <laughs> That's us, the, the inventors of comics. So, so uh, here I am. So here I am at Doug's, and then I drive on into uh, 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 New York, and I go to Gabriel Laterman's, and he's pulling stuff out, and and I'm and I started I showed this to uh, at that New York show I showed it to uh, John Snyder, worked for Steve Jeppy, and at this point in 1997 I'd done a 15 page. Uh, Snyder wanted me to start introducing real history in, into the thing so I wrote an article and, and my, my first one and then price guide number 27 and and I still I'm still believing the yellow kid bullshit I'm still kind of believing the famous funnies kind of stuff but I'm putting back the 
Origins of the American Comic Book back into the late 1890s, pointing out that Yellow Kid at McFadden's Flats is not a comic book. Um, and then getting into the early parts and then, you know, bringing in the concept that the, the format of a dime of a comic book is no different than late stage, what I call late stage dime novels, like Frank Merriwell at Tip Top Weekly. They're slick covers. They're 16 pages inside, but they're two staples and they're pulp paper inside. That format had been around for 30 years by the time Famous Funnies came around. Because that format was first being invented in the early 1900s by the dime novel publishers going on with slick color covers. And um, so I'm, I'm sitting here looking at this, and, I'm, at, and then I, and I show this to Jay Mater, and then it's like a friend of mine and... Um, I'm getting asked to, uh, we'll, we'll, let's create a, a, a uh, what do you want to call it? A platinum age section in the Overstreet Price Guide. Right. But then we start discovering so many 1800 stuff a couple of years later by 2003 that we realized, well, we can break off of it, you know, an, an 1800 section. And at, at this point in time, this is still coming into May of 1999. So I've already done two Overstreet Price Guide articles. Already discovered this Obadiah Old Buck. Jeppy calls in May of 1999. Uh, Jeppy called um, a special meeting of all Overstreet advisors. They're going to revamp the price guide. They're going to do this. They're going to do that. In February of 1999, Maggie Thompson in CBG did the first announcement that this is firm. Comics Guarantee Corporation was going to start certifying third-party things on the comic book gig. So, um, this is all swirling around at the same time. I'm pushing real hard on Overstreet, Jeppy, and these guys that this 1800 stuff, we need to get away from calling this stuff Golden Age, Silver Age, Bronze Age, Copper Age, and, as, you know, ages of comics predicated against superheroes. It was already starting all this nonsense back then. And then Alfredo Castelli, is a senior editor at Sergio Benelli's second largest comic book publisher in Italy invites right. me over to Luca invite invites me over to Luca Comics Festival in outside of your own down down the road from Florence, Italy. Biggest, most prestigious one in Italy is to come give a talk on this Obadiah Old Buck. So I give a talk there that's that's uh, uh this is where he, he got translators so there was comic scholars i don't know 60 80 people in the audience there was comic scholars there from italy france spain and germany with a translator like everybody got have headphones on like uh alex does Trans that's right like little united nations thing translating this hour-long talk and then the guys at angoulême comics museum get wind of the, the thing happening out of Italy. So I get invited over to the Angoulême, France, the in January 2000. So here's the Europeans getting all jumping up and down. And the CGC, these comic American comic book dealers are going, well, how do we market this? As if their only reaction was, how do we make money off of this? So this warfare started growing, this, this disconnect of the actual comic scholarship. All of this is swirling around where it's like, when I came to that May 1999 meeting, it's like we're expanding, pushing back before Famous Funnies. This Obadiah Old Buck exists. Other blanks are starting to get filled in of other comic books. And I never knew existed in the 1800s. Other comic scholars are starting to step forward in the front end of the Overstreet in the price index sections. You'll see about 40 people listed. They're the people that were contributing data. Every anybody that contributed a, a data into those price indexes for for indexing the Mac, each comic book uh, got their name in there. There hasn't been a single change in 10 years. Right. On any level, these guys started. Uh, I started. It started being pushback as the CGC mentality started growing. The pushback from doing actual comic scholarship inside Overstreet started disappearing, and it was all kinds of work. That May 1999 meeting, I did a big, major push. Me and uh, 
uh, Richard Evans at Bedrock Comics and I were supposed to put together a list of 400 of the most important, quote-unquote, underground comics like Zap or Freak Brothers so they can all get listed into Overstreet and be legitimized. So there was all these promises were made, but the reality of what happened is the market, the push, the what's important, it all started going towards the condition of the comic book and first appearances of characters that were, I mean, Hulk 181's a shit book. <laughs> right, it's not a very good comic by itself. I mean, I, I, I never liked it that much, but it was important. Not like they've made it now. Not, not like what they've done to it now where they've, they've suckered people into paying upwards of, you know, $10,000, $20,000 for high-grade copies of that now. Right. You know, that's... So, just too... so Bob, yeah. would you say that one of the problems with, with comic book history is that the the early historians and, and um, a lot of the even current ones have a financial interest in, because they are dealers or they are people in in the actual publishing rather than academics? Um, no, the dealing things came late. The earlier historians were well-intentioned. Every single one of them was well. I knew all those people, like even Maurice Horn and, and all those guys. Bill Blackbeard, Cla Claudia Malterneri out of Paris. I mean, I mean, these guys that were doing these early history books. That's true. The stuff was hard to find. We were able to start succeeding because in, in uh, March of 1998, I, on the old Yahoo groups, I started up a Platinum Age discussion group that, I mean, Art Spiegelman was communicating on it on a constant basis. Spiegelman's got a huge historian's interest in this early stuff. Um, yeah. Chris Ware was on it. Bill Blackbeard was on it. I mean, we had these intense t talks of rediscovering all this early comic strip stuff, and then we, I started up another section for pictures called Plat Picks, where we, all this stuff could get posted. I mean, we, had, we, we, we did explorations on that old group. It's on Yahoo. It's in the archives over there. Platinum Age Comics, all one word, dot com, or whatever, whatever they call it at, at Yahoo. And uh, uh, we pushed the concept of the usage of word balloons back to the walls of Pompeii. In the brothel there, that it, that's in Pompeii, there's there's pictures on the walls with word balloons coming out of people's mouths. Right. We pushed back the concepts of word balloons being printed in America back in the mid 1700s on broadsides. So, so why do you think there's so many errors in and in, in mistakes in in current um, books on on comic history? Because people are just. What's that old adage you write in the book? Read 10 books, write an 11th? People are just reading other history books and then just pass it, regurgitating yeah. that information. I, I know, think that's I, right. I, you know, I mean, that, that's exactly what's wrong. When, once you get something that's wrong in there early on, it just perpetuates itself. Right. There's still people that believe Yellow Kid's the first comic strip. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's like, okay, whatever. It's definitely not the first comic strip. That's true. Well... Even the first year, it's single panels with E.W. Townsend texts. It's just a single illustration for a text story. That's all right. it is. Right. All right. My my second question I wanted to ask you about, and, and couldn't wait to ask you, was um, in terms of of the concepts of the Golden Age, the Silver Age, and and what you're talking about, the Platinum Age, and things is is a different uh, different approach. Do you think that those concepts have been helpful in the formulation of comics history, or do you think they've been detrimental to some degree? And the reason I ask that is because they are used by a certain portion of comic book uh, fans and scholars to really favor superhero markers against all other development of artists and such. I, I think that uh, I... a lot of people... Yes, go ahead. No, no, no. Well, I enjoy superheroes. I've always enjoyed superheroes. Me too. I don't think superheroes are the be-all, end-all of comic books, and that's where uh, the present-day marketplace fucks up, and they're destroying the hobby. 
but in terms of the the key dates for golden age and 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 silver age and bronze age and everything it is in a superhero mindset but for most people when they're talking about it and i think that creates that lack of understanding that a lot of things that were really important oh, especially with on. showcase especially with showcase number 4 yeah one one can make an argument i mean action number 1 superman did not save anything People want to cycle babble Superman save the, the comic book because it was just a bunch of newspaper reprints. Well, that's bullshit. It's not true. Uh, showcase number four, October, September, October, 1956. Overstreet Price Guide started listing every other comic book from September, October, 1956's first Silver Age issue and would jack the price up of that one issue. Of all these other DCs, all these other Marvels at the time, you go back... You go through the price guide and figure out what's September, October. I think it's October 1956. And it just it peels peels them out. First Silver Age issue. I mean, it's like Showcase 4, a, whole, a year later, Showcase 8 shows up. A whole year after that, Showcase 13 and 14 shows up. So we're talking three years from Showcase 8 four to eight to 13 and 14 and then you get flash 105 in, in in 1959 three years later yeah um how should we put it it's like showcase four uh why is that see that was comic book dealers and i was part of that psycho babble back in the 70s and 80s and then and then they're, they're figuring out, okay, we got to have something, another age in between Silver Age and, and Modern Age, right? There's always been this problem of putting in an age and right. then, uh, ha then having Modern Age. So it was okay back in the 80s where the 80s was the mo Modern Age, but then let's start figuring out what's the Bronze Age. Right. You know, so they want to figure out, is it Hulk 181? Is it Conan 1? Is it New Gods 1? And this is all ridiculously stupid if we had been dependent upon so, uh, superhero comics in the 70s to survive as comic book stores up until john Byrne starts doing x-men would have starved to death right the it 70s was about other genres it was selling. like it was like the 1930s pulp type stuff was getting popular well we were we were surviving off of bruce lee and farrah fawcett posters right actually <laughs> um, you know and, and then peanut stuff started selling pretty good. And then, yeah, it's just on and on. And, you know, non, non superhero things. I've always pushed that mad paperbacks. Um, oh, people, yeah. Getting people reading this stuff. I don't understand these comic book dealers, these store owners that got suckered in this last 10, 20 years. They're suckered into, they're, they're selling the new comics when I go into comic book store and I'm getting handed the brand new com book. And I'm being charged an extra 50 cents because they're putting a plastic bag and a board on it. Right. I'm getting charged an extra quarter. So I don't want to exaggerate. Getting charged an extra quarter for that. I go, I don't want the board and bag. I'm going to read the damn thing. And I'm probably going to bend a corner in the process. Right. Type of thing. Because, see, this whole mentality of... The direct sales market is always, always was predicated for the years and years and years. Phil Suling was supplying speculators. That's where this thing, he's getting his Sparta load in and then selling them to, to speculators who were trying to go in. Say, go, say you got Golden Gate Agency. There was 900 IDs uh, back when New Gods, Forever People, uh, uh, Green Lantern, Green Arrow, Neil Adams, Johnny, Denny O'Neill issues. Uh, let's just say, like, Jim Starlin, Warlock, ran 9 through 15, is it? And then got canceled. These were books that were being, guys were going into the ID distributors, talking to the people in the back that were on the line, you know, actually processing the books. Then you got guys up front uh, that were the management people of these IDs guy like me walk in the back end there and i'd want to get all the neil adams copies of say green lantern number 89 that that jesus issue oh yeah tied to the plane with the or that orange cover and uh say say you got six different customers first guy in there he'd get all the copies of one issue 
The next guy didn't get any. He might get the damaged ones that the first guy didn't want to get. <clears throat> Anyways, you paid your money in cash. Well, the people in the back there, they're underpaid. They're just, you know, minimum wage employees for the most part. They're pocketing that cash and then telling the people up front, we didn't put the comic books out this week. Didn't right. have time. We shredded them. We, 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 we returned, you know. So this is where this affidavit return fraud was growing. This is what Phil Suling began tapping into using this underground method. This kept growing. And then guys like me, I got successful at it for the longest time till that warehouse flood. But I made more mistakes than I made positive guesses. But when I when I won, I won real big with John Byrne X Men's. I had eighty five thousand John Byrne X Men's destroyed in that warehouse flood. Oof. You know, I, I'd bought Daredevil one eighty one. I'd bought fifteen thousand copies of that. I had I bought I sold about eight thousand nine thousand copies of that. Uh, I had five to six thousand copies destroyed in that flooding. But I, I figured, well, here's a book I can sell forever. DD one, oh, yeah. you know. Sure. So th that was my mentality, and then trying to keep, trying to keep the price as cheap as possible, rather than jacking it up for short term gain. And that's where all these speculators that came in, and all these monthly price guys that came in, they were like all feeding. They were all drinking this Kool Aid that, you know, right up to the point where I. I go, oh, this, this is all bullshit. I don't want to participate. It was like Wizard or one of these monthly price guides. One of these image companies or Valiant or somebody uh, were, was late on a couple books, but they were listed in the, in the price guide, you know, like $3 cover price, but they're listed at $8 hot. The books hadn't even been printed yet. Right. But these were supposed to be all these experts. So that all that crash and burn went away, and then it, it rebuilt itself with this slabbing gig going on where initially early days it was a welcome thing for people that didn't want to buy restored books but it got really nuts to the point where somebody has one little magic marker dot on a comic book that somebody put on there by accident well that's restoration it's good for purple kiss of death right and, and then there's all these people buying all these new comics that they're crazed at their comic book store guy if he's if the, if you know, it's shipped out of wherever it's printed. It gets goes to the diamond distribution thing, goes through UPS, gets to the comic book store, and it doesn't come out nine point eight after it's been sent in to get slammed by the guy that actually bought it. Well, this is a good segue to the next question I had, uh, which was I was I was doing a little research today and I was looking up um, your name on on different sites and things, and um, somebody was tearing into you saying you had sold them a a uh, refurbished book or something and oh and... you've been reading over on cgc where they're just <laughs> making shit up and attacking me yes exactly you're reading so, on cgc so my so question the fbi so i'm going to the fbi <laughs> they, they have i'm not the only guy they attacked they attacked a lot of non-cgc sellers there's been a lot of shilling going on crossing state lines of federal crime shilling on the internet my my question and i say this because as a lawyer I, I get people that put things on Yelp that are just insane because nobody, you know, one side's always going to be unhappy with the divorce lawyer. So when I do my job, somebody hates me a lot of the times. So I know what like things like that are. How in terms of of you, how has social media been to you? Has it been a blessing or a boon or both? Facebook, uh, or, the Facebook a blessing or the opposite or of a blessing. Yes, yes, not a. The correct. Facebook community key, community by and large, has been a blessing. The CGC community is evil. It's just downright. They have bots on there that aren't real people, writing shit up about people. I've done a lot of investigation. You know, I could, I'm, 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 you know, I'm not kidding. I, I am going to the FBI per, real soon here. I've been talking about it. I've been gathering my little pieces of data and stuff like this. I've been waiting for a good time. I don't know if, if it's a good time to go into the FBI headquarters with the government shut down right now, but who knows? Is it, Would you say that um, 
all of this was present back before uh, the internet, but just in der- you were talking about how um, you would have message groups that would um, uh, that would reach out to each other, but it would take months at a time. Is it still the same, or do you think this has put something um, no? It's more, more dangerous uh, on Facebook. You know, there's subgroups. I'm on two thousand different Facebook groups. You know, every every single comic book artist seems to have a little Facebook group, anywhere from fifty people to. Well, you guys are closing in on ten thousand now, aren't you? Yeah. And we're honored how much you stay. You, we we see a lot of you, and we we appreciate it. That's right. Yeah, and sometimes I, I I post in there, and then other times I'm not, I'm not I'm going well. You know, if I post this, it's gonna, it's going to be gone in a day. You even like an occasional horse, so I I, I well, greatly no, appreciate it. No, it's like all these different. It's not that. It's it's when you get nine thousand people, and say you got one percent of them, or you know, I can't. Well, I don't want to exaggerate. Say ten percent. You know, that'd be nine hundred people posting every day. Yes. <laughs> so you get one. You get down to even one percent of nine thousand people. That's what is that? Still ninety in a day. Ninety postings in one group in a day, and in two days your thing's buried. It's like twenty feet back on a scroll type of thing. So, for, for me, going through all these different groups is, is uh, oh god, how should I put this? I mean, because uh, earlier on I was using the groups I would like post in and then go, get into conversations and then say I got one of these for sale and then have a just. And I would go round and round, so like every few months, I would be posting something for sale in somebody's group. And I got locked into all that. I need, needed to raise money for Katie, and and all that going on. The more I was doing that, the more intense the attacks on CGC became. Ah, is why wow. I was bringing all that side stuff up. The CGC attacks just took on a life of themselves. It got it got to the point in the summer of 2015. Steve Jeppe called the owner of CGC to knock it off. Leave Beer Bomb alone. Stop it. You'll regret well, it. There's a there, there's a lot of that stuff out there for sure. Um, Je, Je, Jeppe threatened the owner of CGC. Summer of 2015. Let they, me they ask just, you. They, they, CGC destroyed my comic book business. So I'm just I'm not dealing I'm not going to deal on tables and you know Spurlock was going to give me a table I'm I'm not I'm just not dealing comics anymore. Are are you out completely? Well, am I out completely? You should see this house. <laughs> no, I'm not. I mean, I, what's your definition of out? Well, it sounds like you've been. You've had several opportunities fate has given you to, to where you would you, a lot of people would have walked away and you you always seem to to be lured back in within a, a year or so even when you when I you're, never went away it's just people started noticing me again a year or two, or two later yeah <laughs> no it's like the comic stuff here it's like it's like I, I I go in any direction I just stop and I I well, I haven't gone through this box, and I start flipping through boxes, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm rediscovering fanzines from the nineteen comics fanzines from the nineteen thirties that aren't in Bill Shelley's Golden Age of Comics fandom book. All that stuff he's got from the nineteen thirties about collecting comic books, he got all that data from me twenty years ago. One one final question for me. Um, in terms of, of recent developments in comics, uh, and you can define recent however you want to, but sure. w- what is what is the most discouraging thing for you to happen in comics in, in recent times, and what's the most encouraging thing to happen uh, in comics in recent times? Encouraging is hard ones. I mean, d- discouraging? Uh, the way... People have been suckered into paying stupid money for comic books. Uh, they got that GPA system. They got eBay sales. People shill up on eBay. Say you can sell a comic book for $10,000 on eBay. You can do a $9,950 refund over on PayPal. eBay still says it's 
says it's sold in the ten thousand dollar thing it gets into the gpa thing somebody else that doesn't know what they're doing believes the gpa data and does bids on heritage or comic connect or comic link as examples of well the book's going the gpa says it's going for this much money so i can safely you know but it might be it's like uh when Gal- guardians of the galaxy first came out uh, one of those uh, tales from two astonished 13s first group got jacked up right in a bidding war up to thirty nine thousand dollars was it really that's that's we crazy. got into the gpa that way there's been a lot of other books like that that's an extreme example but there's been a lot of other books like that where my experience you know you can buy something on eBay and then it just gets refunded back through PayPal. A buyer on eBay can open up a case on eBay and, he, and then if he doesn't like what happens there, he can open up another case on the same thing over on PayPal. And that has been abused for a long time where, where all this data on, on GPS I mean, people are now. People are I'm noticing. I'm talking on CGC because I stopped going on there. I mean, what caused this warfare with CGC and these attackings? They uh, Jerry Bales had died. I had taken down. I'd flown down a run of All Star Comics. Jerry Bales has run All Star Comics. They popped a bottom staple off of All Star Number Eight. That at the time was theoretically worth sixty five thousand dollars. Popped the bottom staple off of it and. And uh, they damaged it. They destroyed the value of that book. I started saying to the owner of CGC, to Borak, and then and then at the owner that this isn't about Bob Beerball making any money. You guys need to mail a check for sixty five grand to, over to Gene Bales. You need to buy this book for retail. Don't you guarantee anything? And that's when the attack started happening. First, it was an uh-huh. inside. First, it was inside CGC, and then in 2011, it flipped over into attacking my eBay store. eBay calls the uh, phenomena intent to disrupt. Yeah. And my store got frozen five times. The computer algorithm, so the, the, uh, the yellow report buyer button on the feedback page. My case went to the board of directors, and so th- that came out of it. Uh, a little bit later... Uh, people were uh, people attacking other stores. Uh, they were using uh, evaluation processes in the stores. Uh, item one star, one star, not as described. They were using that for part of the evaluation of an anchor store. So you could buy a book for ten dollars, give a guy green feedback, give him a one star item not as described. Now, if you get a percentage of your sales, one star item not as describes. Say I'm, you know, it's only a couple percent. Say I'm selling hundreds of, you know, sales a month, but say I accumulate 10, 20, one star item not as describes. Well, the computer would freeze up your store. There was so much ah. fraud. On, there was so much fraud on eBay of employees helping people perpetuate frauds on the stores. eBay's own computer systems, even the president of eBay, that the algorithm freezes up your storefront it's frozen for four months before it reopens again nothing they can do about it at the time that happened in 2015 that was the last heavy duty attack the ebay you're getting you're giving sales amounts uh uh, uh, parameters my sales parameters were six hundred and fifty thousand dollars and uh, 9,000 items. At the time, I had $540,000 worth of stuff in my store, and I had 7,400 items. That attack on my eBay store reduced my selling limits. That's the term, selling limits, down to <clears throat> 2,540 items from 9,000 items. And from six thousand six hundred and fifty thousand dollars, I could list in my listings, down to two hundred and fifty four thousand dollars. Excuse me, one hundred and fifty four thousand dollars. I spent the next four months 
figuring out a half a million dollars worth of stuff not to relist rather than going all through summer rather than getting ready for that Christmas. That's when Jeppy called uh, um, the owner of CGC. Now, the flip side of all this, you know, the CGC people have a lot of clout because they buy a lot of pages of ads, color ads, and overstreet price guide. These guys, all these big dealers, they're all in cahoots with each other. This has all been a scam. I've been, these other dealers are saying, go with the flow, Bob. What are you trying to make waves for? We're all making money. We're making great money. I'm going. <laughs> uh, well, let's let's leave on the the uh, on a on a more positive note. Um, so, what is there anything encouraging you can say? Um, oh, whether it's digital comics it. or the, there's all um, kinds of encouraging things. I I think uh, getting the 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 prospect, the concept of comic book store owners focusing back in on reading comics. And getting away from this whole slabbing mentality, that's not a, that's like a, 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 a manipulated commodity. Man, manipulated commodities always find gravity. History says so. Starting from tulip mania onwards is the first documented craze of uh, manipulation like this. People so do you think do you think retail will survive uh, the the digital age of comics? I think so. I think uh, what I'm starting to work on, and I'm starting to gather my little forces. I want to put together a ten, twelve episode documentary that I want to try to sell to um, Amazon or Netflix or somebody HBO. We get it into the junior highs. Have a whole semester long of, of a comic book comics course in popular culture, tying in all these movies and the radio shows and vaudeville, the comics vaudeville and the comic books themselves, and all the comic stuff that's been made. That's been this one big popular culture unfolding. It's like I've got ads for bringing up father those couples and Leon's. The first three. Bringing Up Father 1, 2, and 3, 1919, 1920. They sold two and a half million copies of those three things, those three comic books. Comic sales now, it's like they want to predicate, going back into Golden Age, Silver Age, Walt Disney's comics and stories was selling uh, four to five million copies an issue it, it, from at, right after World War II, it threw into the mid late 50s. They were selling millions of an issue. No, no, no DC comic book or Archie or Harvey or, or any of these other companies were selling the numbers that Dell Comics was selling. Dell Comics had no ads in them for the longest time, up until 1961 or so, when they tried that 15-cent cover price thing. They started yeah. putting ads in there. But, but prior to that, there's no ads, for the, for the most part, for almost up until the late 50s. Up in, I'd say up, up until 1957, he started putting ads in after American news went down. In 57, he had to go over to independent news. And uh, to me, like Mad Number 1, Uncle Scrooge Number 1 in 1952, the Silver Age of comics, you could say, is 1952. If we have a Silver Age, it was like a Four billion comic books were printed in 1952. It was the largest glut ever. The second largest glut was that two years coming after the... during the Batman TV show craze. There's the second largest glut in comic book history. Which caused all these distributors to want to stop selling comic books. That's what was going on in 52. That was what was going on in 68. The, all these IDs, they didn't want to be shoveling all this paper was going in, going on the shelves, and coming back off. For the most part. And everybody published a superhero. Fantastic Four, number one, it's like a stupid book. Number two is also. Number three, I looked at and didn't buy it. I go, this is semi-interesting. Number four, I bought of FF. Because it's good. Because <laughs> it was great. Yes. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I I didn't buy Hulk one when I saw it on the racks. I bought number two because I liked the Frankenstein version on Hulk number two cover. 
Yeah. Looks like, looks like Frankenstein. And then three, four, and five, but those were stupid. Then I bought number six because it was Ditko. Yeah, I was going to say that one, that's the one to buy because it's got those Ditko. Now, you go on and on through all these different things where you're like examining this stuff and why has superhero? You know, it all goes back to part of this all goes back to those Marvel started was having classified ads. So this is who the big influx of comic book collectors. If DC, if Gold Key, if ACG, if they'd all been Charlton was running uh, uh, classified ads. You find classified ads for comic book dealers, mail order comic book dealers early on in Charlton comics. But outside of Ditko, who cares? With with that whole company's output in the collector's market now. Was Warren doing it? No. Okay. Warren's ads were all Warren for Warren stuff. Yeah, that's that's what for I was saying. Whatever thinking. his Captain Company or something, I, I think he called it. Uh, yeah, I mean that was just, that was all ads for Warren stuff that you could send into his warehouse. So he was. Now Jim Warren, he he saw saw himself as part of the underground alternative. Oh. From when, when he started up with famous monsters and then creepy and eerie and stuff like this, he saw him as himself on the outside looking in. When we did that 1973 um, Berkeley Con, focused on underground on create, creator owned royalty paying comics. Oh yeah, uh, the only non alternative comics publisher that placed an ad in our program book that Rick Griffin did the cover of was. Warren, he placed a full page ad. I think it says something to the effect of "Happy Birthday, Trina Robbins." <laughs> <laughs> I think this is what, or something to that effect, of, or Trina Robbins is a swell gal, or something to that effect. Because Trina had designed the Vampirella costume. Right. That's right. Did the painting of. That's right. But Warren, he's another guy that blew out and stuff like that. He over he did way too much cocaine. Really? That's where he. That's, where he, that's, that's why he crashed and burned. Yeah. Oh, I see. In the eighties, huh? Interesting. I had a lost year and a half after that warehouse flood. I, I went off the deep end, and I, I've been, how should we say, clean and sober since August of nineteen eighty-seven. Oh, okay. Which was how I was able to get Rick Griffin out of his pit, away from um, he'd gotten in with this woman, and then was, and then back in, in and around the Grateful Dead and other rock and roll bands in nineteen eighty nine and ninety. Yeah, he, he he was his lady friend. She liked doing eight ball mixes, which is oh. heroin and cocaine mixed together. Right, and that's what John Belushi died of. Right, overdosed, overdosed on. But yeah, no, it's it's like. Comic book reading, who's that Rayana lady that does those comic books for Scholastic? She's done seven of them now. Rihanna, Tisha, I don't know how to I don't remember her name exactly. They sold like sure. eight million, of, but she's done like seven comic books for Scholastic. They sold like eight million of them. Girls are buying them. Yeah. Manga's yeah. selling like still selling over in Japan, is my understanding. People are still reading the things, but in comic book stores, you go into them and they're bagged up, treated as like, you know, you got to go through the whole nine yards of being trained into get that book in near mint, go to some show, pay a witness to get the guy to sign it, then go over and get it slabbed. So you haven't even read the comic book, you got a signature on the cover, and it's you're now $80 into this book after it's all said and done. Yeah, I watch the activity uh, at, the, at the comic store I buy books from um, after uh, uh, the Batman Dam book came out, where people were buying as many copies as they could on up for Batman's penis. And then when DC pulled it, it, it was it shot up in price like to crazy amounts, at least on a temporary basis. And it's it's like it's all nonsense. But see, they do did all they, that did manipulation they, over inside the CGC boards. Jim, did they pull uh, the Batman comic or Batman's penis? 
No, they they they, they pulled the comic itself. Well, oh, I no, see. No, they, were, no. they, couldn't, they uh. couldn't pull it. I mean, it's like none of those dealers were going to return anything. They just simply tried to cover it up. I mean, literally, sure. fig figuratively and literally, they tried like just not talking about it. You don't you don't tug on Superman's cape. You don't pull on Batman's penis. Is that what it is? <laughs> there you go. I mean, I remember back in the code days and stuff like that. John Ver Putin was good at sneaking stuff past. Um, Daredevil, Daredevil eighty eighty fights Stilt Man, and there's a it's like on Times Square, and there's a marquee there, and it's, it's supposed to be as Spain does something, but it reads because it's in in between Stuart Stilt Man's stilt legs, it reads as Spain. Ah, right, right I remember that. I read, definitely read that before. There's a 25 cent uh, Kazar cover. It's a reprint, 25 cent issue, and there's bushes in the background, and it's one of the bushes in one of these, the, the branches in one of the bushes behind Kazar, Kazar and Taboo, says uh, the branches spell out the word fuck. Yeah, yeah I, I, I I remember that too. Yes, no, I, I've never see seen if that. He could, if he could get it, past it's in the, the it's in the corner of the page, Jim. You you may no, have seen in, it actually. It's in the background. It's in the background, but it's 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 just there. You don't really see it until you see it, and then that's all you can see. <laughs> Once it's pointed out, that's all <laughs> well, yeah. you can see on the cover. I think the inker put it in. Well, the, the story went at the time when it was current uh, that it, that that Vera Putin. The letter had snuck it in. Oh, I see. Verp uh, Verpotin. Yeah, Verp Verpotin would have been lettering, and it would, it would have been Verpotin. doing Verpotin. Yeah. Ver Verpotin. Yeah. I mean, he was not, he was, not he was Vlad doing... Putin. <laughs> oh, what did I say? I thought you said Vlad Putin. No. No, Ver V E R. Yeah, Verpotin. Yeah, Verpotin. I yeah, I never could pronounce his name. Uh, I can do, I, 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 I can do Mister Mixias Pedelec real good. You Very can. Easily. Well, I think they, well, they also oh. call them uh, Jumbo Jim or something. You know, so that, that, I mean, there was other th things being snuck by the Comics Code. Now, the Comics Code that was an attack of the Catholic Church on ma mainly starting out Catholic Church mainly on Jewish owned businesses. It was the Church that came down hard on the comics. The comic books were mainly published by Jewish people. So what about so you're saying treasure chest was out to take out was the treasure no, chest treasure, chest, was, treasure uh, chest is taking down names <laughs> using Reed Crandall using Reed Crandall to just knock them all down like it's the val the go. Valentine no, treasure massacre chest starts in 1946. I have uh, treasure chest number one. Tre here. Treasure chest Valentine massacre. In other words, the comics code. That's what we're saying. Judge yeah. Murphy, yeah, no, no. Did you, did I'm you not see the saying lady? it. This is guy, guy, Golcroft or something like that. The lady that was pictures in 1955. She's the one that's inspecting all the comic books, right? I mean, it's like she looks like a female version of Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> Wait a minute. I don't know if we're allowed to say that, but I, no, I, no, like, where, I like where you're going, though. I don't know if we're allowed to say it. Well, you, you can you can edit out. You know, you, do I edit, edit, do I edit, edit the Ben anyway. Franklin thing, Jim? You tell me, man. Anyway, no, we, we, scary ben women. Franklin she comes up a lot in these podcasts. It's, it's, <laughs> so we're keeping that one, okay? <laughs> okay. I don't care one way or the other. I'm just, you know. No, I know, I know. I just gotta, you know. Jim is my conscience here. <laughs> sure. You know, it, it, it's it's like, I mean. When I first started realizing that, of just looking at who the publishers were and who were the people actually doing the attacking, it's like uh, uh, the the 1954 Good Housekeeping article that has Jim uh, with 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 the Wortham Horror in the Nursery right. article, that famous excerpt out of Seduction of the Innocent. Right. Good Housekeeping magazine started attacking comics beginning in 1909. Yeah, and savage attacks on comic strips back then. Starting back then, what was going on with that big, huge glut? And these books aren't getting out, and and there's more comic books than there are people in America to buy them in 1952. Is picture a lemonade stand? You know, a couple of kids at, at, at a lemonade stand, and they're, and they're and picture they got comic books for sale there. 
picture dozens of these block after block after block, especially in the big cities. Like, like you know, imagine that, like how these kids these days with this, their phones running around getting all that Pokemon treasure. Right. Getting all, get, that's how the comic book craze was back then. Kids were not, didn't want to, you know, weren't going to church. I mean, they, they, were, they, weren't, they weren't doing anything except right. re- reading comics uh-huh. and buying and selling them. And then a, a guy would like, well, guy on one block's got this for sale. A guy on a, some other block's got something else for sale. And a third guy's got a book he wants and somebody's got no money. He's He's running around. I mean, I had old timers back in the 60s telling me this that they were doing this as kids back in the 1960s in the rbccs there's ads for couples and leons comic books from the 1920s there's ads all over the place for the 20s couples and, and other 30s square bound those 10 by 10 comic books and, the, and these other sizes in formats but those ads start disappearing in the 1970s the people were dying this whole thing with this whole thing about the, the TV show and all this crazy stuff and slabbing the books up to the point where now, you know, a 1.8 dog shit, Amazing Fantasy 15, they're bringing thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 for poor, but it slabs up and presents well. Comic book co- people aren't buying this stuff. This is being sold to some investor who's who's basically expanding his investment portfolio because he's right. getting told to by experts. That's the market that's going to crash and burn because those people are not buying them for any other reason other than they're supposedly worth money. Right. So you gotta keep buy- then you got to keep finding a bigger fool. When are we going to run out of fools on this becomes the, becomes the question. But in the meantime... All these movies coming out that are setting all these records is not translating into new comic book sales for these titles. Except things like that Batman, whatever that is. What issue that ever, whatever that appeared in. I I saw it on a Facebook page till it got deleted by Facebook. (laughs) That one page. Well, I I gotta say... With some of those, it's like Marvel seems to almost deliberately sabotage their their books from experiencing sales based on their their titles. I mean, when they have a new um, film coming out with Thor, that that's when they change the characters, so it's not the same Thor that they see. Um, and I like that run, but but that seems like a problem. Iron Man. They were turning out the worst Iron Man comics, just uh, so unlikable at the time that that those that uh, the Downey movies were coming out. It just seems like they get it wrong, and I I don't know why they're so bad at it. Because they don't know what they're doing. Because they've never all of these suits have never understood what the direct sales market's always been about. And I get into all kinds of arguments with all kinds of quote unquote historians and or dealers over the origins of the direct market until people understand what the direct market was always, always has been about is creator own royalty paying comics that did not originate with those code comics coming out of Sparta that came out. The guy that threw the rock into the lake was Robert Crumb with that hand printed up zap number one. But even then Mo Moskowitz, Mo's books in Berkeley on telegraph. You ever been there before? No, I know. I know of it. I've had people speak. Super Mo well Moskowitz, it. back in the fifties, he and Don Schenker would were beatneck roommates in Greenwich Village. He moved out to the Bay Area. You know the, that whole summer of love thing. And Mo opens up the bookstore on Telegraph Avenue, and print mints doing posters and stuff like this. Don Schenker, Don and Alice Schenker, and Bob and Peggy Rita. Bob and Peggy Rita. Bob was from Hawaii. Rita. A Peggy Rita, his wife was uh, an American Indian, and stuff like this. Um, when when the first Zap bus started happening, Mo was getting busted. Lawrence uh, Ferlinghetti, Lawrence Ferlinghetti at City Lights City Lights Books in San Francisco was it's being busted. We were being busted over Zap number four. Ah, with that, with that Joe Blow satire story about incest. 
Right. That's what they were being busted for. If Crumb had done, had never done that story, then it, that's that Zap Number Four would never have gone to the U.S. Supreme Court in June twenty third of nineteen seventy three, which paralyzed the alternative comic book market business in America because it's crossing state lines with uh, purient material. Because what the, what the SCOTUS declared was establishing something they called local community standards shall prevail, which means at the time back then, any town, any county, any state, municipality, whatever level, could, de- could declare what's, what's uh, pornographic and what's not. Local community standards, which led to like 80 bus across the country. Phil Suling got busted for Zap Comics. So did Johnny Levis, his girlfriend, and a couple other people at one of his one-day shows. Um, what put Printmen out of business, ultimately, they were dealing, trying to defend over 80 bus nationwide. They were trying to help these head shops that were selling comic books, these alternative comics. Another tactic that was being used by the law was declaring that these underground comics were um, instruction manuals. So here you got your head shop selling your tobacco products for your your glass pipes for smoking tobacco, your zigzag papers for rolling your own tobacco cigarettes, etc. So a lot of these head shops selling these these comics and stuff like this, 1971, 72, 73, um, were faced with a choice, selling the comics or selling the uh, smoking aids. A lot of them chose to sell the comic books, to sell the Freak Brothers and the Saps. And that's where a lot of Phil's early customers, that's where they started selling, turning into comic book stores from that direction. Oh, that's interesting. Then, then there's the comic book fandom coming out from that direction. And there we were, you know, Zap was being put out for sale in 1968 in RBCC. There's ads for Zap comics. And it's like Zap, this whole San Francisco energy and then that Chicago energy of Bijou with Jay Lynch and Skip Williamson, all of that's just been pushed off to the side like it's some other uh, alien life form that it's not listed in Overstreet, therefore it's not a legitimate comic book. I don't understand this. And I started getting vocal having these discussions out on these with these comic book dealers, the guys that are just in it for the money. And we're talking millions and millions of dollars now. I mean, it's like the last uh, uh, heritage auction broke three, four million dollars. Maybe, probably more. I think it was more than that even. It's yeah, a- I, I, I think this is an important conversation to have, Bob. And I, I think that, um, there needs to be more uh, press about it and more, more writing about it outside of comic circles as well because people don't understand at all um, and they don't think of it that way. And, and everything you're saying is, uh, is exactly right. I when, I, with when I was pointing all this stuff out on the CGC boards, you know, concern for the direction of the hobby, where I knew it would go. We would take it, and where it's gone now, it's like the comic collecting comics is not fun anymore. There, there's no level of fun in it anymore. I no, that I can see. I I still have fun. I, I have oh, to I say. have fun with what I'm doing at it, but collecting comics as a broad spectrum collecting, it, it, it's not fun anymore. So it's not the the, the dealing of them isn't fun anymore. You know, it's just like, you know, me, me trying to have a conversation with one of these comic book dealers, you know, and all I, all I can talk with them about is how many spine bends does this book have? They can psychobabble about the cover. Oh, yeah, it'll be Cole Covers or Alex Schomburg Covers. Or then we're having a discussion of, of it. Does it got a corner bend on it? Got spine bends? Is it? How come it's 9.8 and, you know, it's not... It's 9.4. Why is it 9.6? I mean, that's like boring to me, but these other guys really get off on it on it because it's about the money. Yeah. No, I hate that stuff. I I yeah. like finding 
the new stuff or, or the old stuff that I didn't know, and and it's it's more about a study than it is um, a collection. So, my research boxes that I have here, I mean, comic books, you, you know, for thousands of dollars to compete out there, you need a two comma bankroll to compete anymore. These really big dealers that have been sliding all this stuff up with these big collections that are coming on the marketplace, say they're going to, say they figure out, oh, we can take in $1.4 million off this guy's collection. You know, having that kind of money to, I can't can't even acquire the stuff anymore. It does seem like it's it's almost analogous to uh, to some restaurant's wine list where, the only way you're going to order those wines or, or if you're on an expense account, that's it's somebody else's money and it's not, and it, it takes all the fun out of, 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 of uh, even looking at a wine list uh, at some of those restaurants. And it's, it's the same thing. You can't really, a regular person can't get into it. It, it has to be somebody that's an investment person with other people's money almost. Well, the other people's money goes right hand in hand with, uh, uh, there has been virtually no interest rate on borrowing money. Um, people are piling up monies. They're getting told by other people, yeah, I'm buying a selling you know, on Heritage. So people are buying books. You're going by the word that the, the auction house says. Heritage shills on its own stuff. It says right in the, it's legal to shill in auctions, a, an auction house to shill on their own stuff in Texas. It's 100% legal. It's, it's illegal in Illinois. The confusion when you cross state lines going from ah. Texas law into Illinois law, you can go Google Mastronet, M-A-S-T-R-O, Mastro, N-E-T, Mastronet.com. The owners were busted by the FBI and put in federal prison on uh, June of 2016 for five years. Mastronet was the largest certification and auction house for sports memorabilia. Uh, Mastronet started getting into comic books. They they were actually becoming bigger than Heritage is now. But then they the the uh, greater conspiracy is is upwards of a couple hundred people involved. The same is true in the comic book world. All these big dealers that have all these big slabbed up books, they're all in on it. You know, I I lived my life as this sped up and as the internet kept getting faster and faster and as Amazon mentality kept increasing and increasing of buying it, it's in the mail the next day. You know, this is where Buddy Saunders, he can't set up at his shows anymore. He's got this whole thing all, all organized for strictly mail order. And the whole inventory control system is based off of barcode numbers. So if he's got, say, 50 copies of Spider-Man number 100, it's in 50 different places in his warehouse. Based on, off the barcode numbers, how he inventory controls his stuff. Well, Alex, I if I don't go to bed soon, I'm going right. to fall asleep watching Mary Poppins tomorrow. And All right, that sounds good. So, you know is what? Is there a uh, remake of Mary Poppins? I, yes. I'm yeah, sorry. there's a there's a remake of Mary Poppins and I I fell asleep in the middle of whatever the last movie I took uh, my kid to. And oh. and then people <laughs> He's a 5-year-old and 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 then I get people sure. um People asking me at the at the uh, snack counter if I'm uh, if this is my grandson. So there you uh, go. Huh. All of them. Whoa! <laughs> I like it. Well, um, Bob, thank you Once so much for uh, joining us sure. today. I really uh, appreciate we just it. Got started. There's a lot more to go. You you guys know <laughs> this. You know this. It's always. No, I know. Well, you've seen you've seen here. a lot, and uh, I, I I'm glad that we got some of that today. Jim, I'm glad that you were here too, actually, as the co-host. Yeah, I, like, I enjoyed it. And Bob, thank you so much for joining us today. You know, it was a it was a good exploration of 1975 and beyond because we got through 1992 to Obadiah Olba. No, we just talked about the, it. We, 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 we the, just touched on all of those subjects. Right. Well, of course, stuff. everything just is just touched. touching on something, obviously. And uh, our li- listeners appreciate it. And... Um, and it's been fun, and hopefully we'll do more, and then somebody might actually put a reply on the 
There you go. You, you know, we, 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 I have to listen to it and uh, encourage people to do more of these things here. This has been uh, this has been a fun episode, of, and stay tuned for the next episode of the Comic Book Historians Podcast. It's been fun. Thank you very much. Thank you.